if you do this the way that I'm saying it, you will look good faster and better than you, you would if you did it the wrong way. Because I think sometimes people feel like there's a trade. So somebody watching right now might be like, yeah, that sounds really good. You know what he's saying? But I just want to. I just want to get this weight off right now. Like I'm so I got eager. my wedding coming up. I got this. Yeah. I got this situation. No, no, no. And... The wrong way is the wrong way in every <laughs> every facet. You're not going to get there faster by doing it the wrong way. You're not going to you're going to get there faster and better doing it the way that I'm describing, okay? There is a right dose when it comes to um exercise. And the right dose gets you there the fastest. More gets you there slower. Now we're compromising ability to adapt and recover. Too little, obviously, I'm not uh, sending the signal, uh, a signal that's strong enough to get my body to adapt the way that I want it to. There is a right dose and more or less gets me there slower. So I want to say that because it's a very important selling point to what I'm saying. It's also extremely true. You'll get there faster, I promise you. And, it do, and it'll feel easier. And this is where people get caught up. They think, oh, I can do more. If I do more, then I'll get there faster. No, no, no. There's the right dose, and then there's what you could tolerate, and then beyond. What you can tolerate is not what gets your body to adapt the fastest. What gets you your body to adapt the fastest is the, the right dose. All right, let's talk about uh, longevity for a second. Muscle is extremely protective. This is, this is uh, we're, now, we're just now starting to figure this out, by the way. All the studies, maybe up until the last, I'd say, decade, most of the studies done on exercise and health revolved around one form of exercise, cardiovascular activity. I mean, you pick any study from, you know, 10 years ago and beyond and all, all the forms of exercise, every study used cardiovascular activity. Why? I think it was the easiest to apply. It was the one everybody understood. Um, it's easy with animals, put them on a hamster wheel. It's kind of hard to get a hamster to lift weights <laughs> or do yoga. So that's, that's, what we saw. So very little studies were done on strength training and muscle and it's a protective effects, except for maybe with athletes and performance, there really wasn't uh, anything that was out there. Well, now we have data that supports what those of us uh, who've worked with uh, everyday people for a while have, have seen, which is that muscle is extremely um, important for longevity. In fact, so muscle we can use, we could talk about strength because strength is a, a great proxy for muscle. Okay. Uh, there's one test that we're now, we're, we're now really starting to figure this out. And there's several studies on this. There's one metric that a doctor could use that will predict all cause mortality better than almost any other single metric. Okay. Now, to be clear, if you want to predict all cause mortality, you want to use multiple metrics. That's how you're going to get the most accurate reading. But if you had to pick one, there's actually one that's better than all the others. It's a grip strength test. A simple grip strength test will tell you more about somebody's all-cause mortality than almost anything else. Why? Because, uh, well, first, grip strength is a proxy for overall body strength, and body strength is a proxy for muscle. Well, what is that telling us? Well, a couple different things. One, uh, mobility. Uh, Anybody who's ever taken care of uh, an elderly family member will tell you this, uh, but loss of mobility is a significant contributor contributor to uh, mortality. Okay, there's a saying in uh, medicine: you break your hip and you die of pneumonia. Uh, your your bone strength, your ability to care for yourself and move, this is all very very important when it comes to longevity. And uh, the the less you can care for yourself and the less you move, the faster your health. Uh, begins to decline. Well, muscle is is how we move. So strength and mobility, you need those to be able to do those things. There's also the hormone uh, effects of muscle. We talked about insulin sensitivity uh, off air. You mentioned, um, I think you mentioned Alzheimer's or dementia as type three diabetes. Um, this uh, this was speculated for a while. We're just now starting to see that this is probably what's going on. That it's the brain. Uh, becoming, maybe losing its ability to use glucose the way that it, it could before. And we start to see these uh, these detriments in our cognitive function, and that starts to decline very quickly after a certain period of time. Nothing improves insulin sensitivity like building muscle. Nothing. In fact, there was a study de done out of uh, Australia, Sydney, Australia, where they used strength training 
and they saw the, the, the halting of the progression of beta amyloid plaque in Alzheimer's patients. And it was actually the first time a non-medical intervention showed that. In fact, wow. uh, it started to trend towards it reversing, which was mm. kind of uh, interesting. Um, so insulin sensitivity, that's a big one. Uh, let's talk about metabolism again. Here's why the amount of calories your body burns on its own is so important. When we look at diet, we can look at components of nutrition and say, these things are healthy, these things aren't so healthy, and these things are not very healthy at all. Uh, sugar, for example. Sugar's got some utility, but there's lots of studies that will point to the overconsumption of sugar and show how it can you know, contribute to you know worse health outcomes, obesity, uh, reduced longevity, all that stuff. Certain fats, uh, there, you know, there's some controversy around saturated fat, but even the studies on saturated fat will show overconsumption can cause all these different things. I'll use those two because those are the two, two most uh, popular ones. When a diet is low in calories, or let me rephrase that, when you're eating a diet that it doesn't, um, doesn't have as more calories than you can burn, okay? So if you can burn more calories than you consume, or at least burn the calories you do consume, the negative effects that we see from things like sugar, saturated fats, and other components in food are greatly reduced, dramatically reduced. Now, it's not perfect, but there are studies, and, and I hate it when scientists do this. because so, so just to make sure I understand that, sorry to interrupt you, because I know you're on a roll. So being in a slight calorie deficit, mm -hmm. you're saying that even the same composition of some of the macros of saturated fat, you know, fats, sugars, other things, they don't have as much damage than being in a surplus where somebody's eating more calories. Some would even argue, and I wouldn't go this far, but some would even argue that the, the damage is almost gone. So scientists love to do this. I love to prove uh, people in the health and wellness space wrong. Uh, now, I'm going to tell you why I think this, they're, what they're saying is also wrong, but the data that they're showing does uh, illustrate something really important. So they'll take, um, they'll do this where they'll say, okay, we put this person on a fast food diet. McDonald's and they were only eating 1500 calories a day and look at all their blood markers better, you know, lipid profile and their inflammatory markers went down and their health improved and they lost weight. And that's their way of showing those of us in the health and wellness space that you're wrong. It's all about calories. Okay. So they're right and they're wrong. One, they're right in that a calorie deficit really does make up a lot of, uh, uh in terms of the, the damage makes a huge just because you're not overloading your body with all those glucose spikes that might be coming with calories. You're not, you're not in a place where your system is always kind of having to work. You're burning it off. You're using it for energy. And that process is healthy. The burning of energy and all that stuff is healthy. But here's why they're wrong. What you eat also determines how you feel and it also influences your behaviors. So whenever somebody presents a study like that to me, and they say it's all about calories and maybe macros and what makes up those macros like proteins, fats, and carbs and calories doesn't matter as long as you hit the right numbers. Um, I would like to see how, uh, how sustainable it would be to eat a 1500 calorie McDonald's diet. Yeah. Okay? For like a year, Never. two years, no way. three years, four no years. No way. <laughs> those, those foods influence your behaviors. They make you want to overeat. They make you feel a particular way. And how you feel determines whether or not you're going to eat one way or another. Not just to mention that, but the environmental setting. You're going to McDonald's, you're picking something up. You feel like, oh, you know what? I've been good for like two weeks. <laughs> I need to treat myself today. You know, the, the Sunday machine is working all of a sudden. Yeah. Let's let's get some of that. So there's so many factors that... There, there is, but it's... Um, but I mean, the point I'm making here is if you can get your metabolism to ramp up it means that you can eat more overall and get away with more overall in the long term. Okay. That's a good thing. Why? Look around. We're, I could right now on my phone while we're doing the show, I could on my phone in 10 minutes have pretty much any flavor of any food that I want delivered here, right this second for very inexpensive. We live in an environment where we are uh, bombarded and surrounded by food uh, and snacks and candy and treats and whatever, a faster metabolism is an asset. Now, 
If this was 50,000 years ago, this would be a very different conversation. 50,000 years ago, our conversation would be, how can we make our metabolism slower? How can we become more efficient? Because I need to survive on the fact that, man, it is hard to find food. Today, it's like, there's so much food and I could try to be a monk with my diet. This is, you know, it's one of the problems that I have with my space in particular. So we're talking about the fitness side of the health and wellness space is it's often communicated by these fanatics, by these like, like, uh, these fitness monks or gurus, or, um, I like to say that they're dysfunctional. A lot of them are orthorexics and they communicate what works for them to the average person. So they'll say things like it's discipline, food is food is fuel and just do it. And it's like the average person's like, what? Like, I don't live to exercise. I exercise to live. That doesn't make any sense to me. I can't, I can't do that. That doesn't, that doesn't work into the fitness fanatic, uh, or someone who's got a dysfunctional relationship with those things. They're like, just do it anyway, type of deal. So no, we want to put ourselves in a position to where we live our lives and, um, you know, Sundays I go out with my friends and we have a pizza and some beer and I go on vacation sometimes. And sometimes we have ice cream and it doesn't cause all these problems because I've got a metabolism that's roaring and that kind of negates a lot of these, uh, a lot of these foods. And it gives me some flexibility. That's a massive asset. It makes things much more sustainable. It protects me. Muscle protects me against the ills of modern life. Here's another thing that muscle does. We're sedentary. All of us are. You know, if you work out for an hour, seven days a week, you're sedentary. People don't realize this. If you have a normal, typical job nowadays, which is at a desk in front of a computer, and you work out one hour every single day, you are still sedentary. And and you don't have anything else is what you're saying. Yeah. No, I mean. And, Besides and, you're just normal, sort of just walking around the house yeah, or whatever. Exactly. You, you, you work out in the morning for an hour, then you go to work, you, you, you sit down at your desk for eight hours, 10 hours, then you drive in your car, you go home sit down, eat dinner. Maybe you, you walk in your Is house Is that a based bit. on a, like a specific definition? I've heard sometimes the definition, you know, that, you know, CDC just put out there is like anything less than like 6,000 steps is sedentary. Or are you just saying evolutionary comparing to like our ancestors were sedentary? Compared to how our bodies evolved to move, we're very sedentary. By the yeah. way, 6,000 steps is, <laughs> you know, CDC puts out, um, interesting guidelines, uh, sometimes, but by, by the way, what is common is not normal. Um, you can look at what the average person does and be like, Oh, that's, that's normal. That's what we should do. No, no, that's just common. Right. 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 Yeah. Modern life. It's uh, common to be overweight today. So yeah. you can't say that that's actually yeah. normal for our biology. Yeah. We're, we're sedentary. Okay. How do I protect my body? Um, in this modern lifestyle where I'm not moving that much. Well, muscle, Muscle does this for you. Uh, I'm not moving much, but I got this muscle on my body that can move when I want it to, that burns calories, that uh, maintains my testosterone levels and makes me sensitive to insulin and growth hormone, helps regulate my cortisol, um, help, helps regulate my mood. There's chemicals in, in muscle when you flex and extend and, and stretch and, and just get up and move in muscle that are released that have antidepressant effects, anti-inflammatory effects, uh, on the body. Um, it's like, it's like an investment. Okay. Um, trying to burn calories by moving all day long, which, okay, you can do that if you want. I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's a sustainable approach for most people. We're busy, but that's fine. But that's like trying to earn money every hour. So I have an hourly wage. I'm just going to, the way I'm going to get wealthy is I'm going to work more and more hours. I mean, that's one way to do it, but there's only so many hours a day. What if you took that money, put it somewhere and it made money for you? This is what muscle essentially does for you. You know, another great thing about muscle, which is kind of cool. Uh, I used to hate this as a trainer. I would get a client that would say something like, um, okay, once I get in shape, then what happens if I stop working out? And I was like, well, then you get out of shape. I guess your body just kind of reverts back, right? There's no, per there's no permanence with this, but there is something interesting about muscle that it's not permanent, but it's pretty cool, pretty close. There's something called muscle memory, and this has been well documented in studies. If you were to gain, let's say, let's say you gain seven pounds of muscle right now, okay, which is very realistic for a male to do, let's say, over the course of maybe six months. You gain seven pounds of lean body mass, and it takes you six months of, of good, consistent exercise. You're, you're feeding your body adequate protein. You gain seven pounds of muscle. And then let's say for whatever reason, you lose it. You stop working out, become very sedentary, and it's gone. You lose it in a month. Seven pounds of lean body mass is gone. 
If you go back to start working out again, you'll gain back that seven pound, seven pounds of lean body mass in like two months, hmm. maybe a month. If you've ever had a cast on a broken limb, you've experienced this. I don't know if you've ever done that, but yeah. you know, yeah, where you, you take the cast off and it's like all the muscles gone and it looks weird. And then very quickly the muscle comes back. There's something called muscle memory. And this has to do with satellite cells and how your body prepares and preps itself to regain muscle that was once lost. So if you build some muscle, gaining it back happens very quickly. We also don't lose muscle very quickly. So if you did strength training very consistently, let's say three days a week, and it was what you did, and then you stopped strength training for a couple of weeks, you wouldn't lose any muscle within a couple of weeks. It would all stay on your body. You stopped exercising for two whole weeks. You probably wouldn't lose any in a whole month as long as your nutrition was okay and you were relatively active. You wouldn't lose much at all. In fact, they did a study... I love this study uh, where they compared two groups of men. One group worked out, strength trained every week, every single week consistently. The other group did three weeks on, one week off. So every month they took a whole week off. At the end of the, I believe it was a 24-week study, the strength and muscle gains were identical. Mm. Identical. They literally worked out one-fourth less than the other group, took a whole week off every month and built the same strength and muscle. Um, there's other studies that show that however much you train to build a certain amount of strength and muscle, about one, some studies show maybe one fifth. I've seen a study that shows one ninth of the training volume is required to keep it. Mm. So you work out, let's say three days a week to get to a certain level of strength and muscle. Then you're happy. Go once a week. It's not going to go anywhere. You're going to keep it. Right now that there's more to that, of course, there's health benefits with just moving and going and all that stuff. So you're, you're probably not gonna have the same health benefits, but from a muscle standpoint, metabolism standpoint, you know, all the stuff that I'm talking about, uh, you're, you, you're kind of going to keep it by doing a lot less. Now, could I possibly paint a more perfect form of exercise in the context of modern life with the average person? Think about their struggles and what they're dealing with and how challenging it is to be consistent. And there's food everywhere. And I'm not like a fanatic. I don't want to work out every single day. And, you know, like hormone imbalances, like, uh, boy, hormone imbalances are, are more common than not nowadays. Like when you think of all those things, is there a form of exercise that is more suitable? There isn't. So, you know, this is what I'm going around preaching right now and trying to explain to people. It's like, look, if you're going to choose a form of exercise and you're, you, you want to do this in a way that's fast and sustainable, Here's the, be the most effective approach. Everything else has got benefit. I don't, I don't want to be, um, you know, I don't want, I don't want to be misunderstood. All activity applied appropriately is good for you. Okay. But one of them definitely shines above the others in the context of, you know, what the average person experiences. I think it's so helpful for you to say it so clearly because there is, as more people are realizing the power of being active and not living this hyper sedentary life that we have. And they have this menu of options that are there. And there's people that are out there that are saying, hey, you know, shoot for those 10,000 steps. And walking is like, at least start there. And, and again, there's going to be an argument yeah. for all of these different things. And you're agreeing to that. And as you start to zoom out and you are a normal human being that's trying to eat well, but maybe still have, you know, some flexibility for mm -hmm. your family, especially if you have kids, you are trying to make sure that you can grow in your career. You're trying to make sure you have some elements of stress management and community and maintain friendships and maintain a social life that's there. And you might have hobbies, uh, community service. You know, these are all the different things that are there in your life. So when it comes to this exercise component and the movement component, it feels increasingly like people have a lot of different options, right? There's like steps, there's, okay, let's do this cardio, yeah. let's do that. And what I'm hearing from you is like, look, all those things can have benefits, mm -hmm. But if you're looking for the one, especially if you're wellness oriented, which is our audience here, that pays the most dividends, yes. we're going to first make sure before everything else, we have an appropriate plan for strength training, you know, as long as you are in a place where you can, you know, do that and you're not like physically hurt and you don't, you're not like, that's the rare exception. We're going to first prioritize strength training. And then if you have extra room, and you love to get extra steps in, amazing. And you can combine that with walking with a friend and you get your social thing in, good. But do not 
under prioritize the strength training piece. Yeah, that should be the, that, and yes. And let me actually touch on a few things uh, that you said there. Um, one of the things I figured out as a trainer, as a coach was, you know, okay, all these things work and here's the things that we need to focus on. And, you know, here's what's most effective. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. But then what really be, helped me become successful, and any coach or trainer right now that's been doing this for over 10 years who's, who's found a high success rate will understand completely what I'm about to say, is how do I do this and communicate this in a way to where the person can make these fundamental changes and maintain them and want to maintain them, okay? Want to continue doing this, that it's not this like white knuckling the whole time. You mentioned steps. Okay. I love walking. Here's why I love walking. Number one, everybody could do it. A uh, very low skill form of activity. Other uh, forms of activity re uh, require a level of skill. People tend to you know, injure themselves running, right? Running, let's go run. Well, most people don't know how to run. They haven't run since they were 10. Uh, they put on their running shoes, they go run and they end up hurting themselves. But most people can walk. And I love walking also because it's easy to inject into your everyday life. So when I would train clients, I would definitely do the strength training part. And that's where I would do a lot of the coaching. But then on the days they didn't see me, I would communicate activity uh, like this. Um, I don't want you to, to take 30 minutes out of your day and hop on a treadmill. Okay, that's way less sustainable than what I'm about to say. What I want you to do is uh, after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, go for a 10-minute walk. Or for every hour you're at your desk, get up and walk for five minutes. And maybe that looks like you go to the bathroom on the second floor. So you just walk up the stairs, go to the bathroom, come back down, go back to your desk. When you add that up, what you find is about 45 minutes or 30 minutes of walking every single day. Now, why do I communicate it this way? Because it's in, it's already kind of, uh, it's, it's easy to inject into your life and it's combined with things that you already do. You know, getting on your workout clothes, going to the treadmill or going to the gym, timing yourself for 30 minutes. I got to schedule the time out, whatever. Much harder to maintain than after you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, just walk for 10 minutes or every hour, go do a five to 10 minute walk in the office. Like way easier to maintain. And people would become uh, far more consistent with that. I found similar approaches with diet, um, with strength training. One other thing you said about strength training um, that I want to touch on is, you know, as so long as you're not injured and it's appropriate for you, strength training has a lot of uh, unique attributes. And I say unique because other forms of exercise don't necessarily share these attributes. And one of them is that strength training can be appropriate for anyone, anyone. Now, someone might be thinking like, what are you talking about? What do you mean anybody? The number one tool in physical therapy that a physical therapist uses for rehab, people who've been injured, car accidents, severe trauma, is strength training. Yeah. What is strength training? Well, yeah, it's, it's you know, picking a barbell off the ground is strength training, but so is uh, using a resistance band or my body weight or creating tension against the wall Let's say I push my arm up against the wall. That would be an isometric form of strength training. Uh, strength training is moldable like no other form of exercise. I could use any amount of weight or no weight and create resistance that can provide the benefits that I'm talking about. All strength training is, is exercising in a way to promote strength, okay, to build strength. Well, when I had, you know, an 85-year-old client who would come hire me. And at one point I had quite a few uh, people um, that were in advanced age to come hire me. And I'd have them sit down on a bench and I'd have them try to reach up above their head. And that would be very challenging for them just to straighten their arm up above their head. Well, that was our exercise. Hmm. And I'd sit behind them and I'd say, straighten your arm out as hard as you can. We're gonna hold that for 10 seconds. That's strength training. Strength training would be for some people going up against the wall, moving your feet away from it and doing some push-ups against the wall. It would be using a resistance band. All you're trying to do is use appropriate resistance. How do you pick appropriate? What do you do now? What's a little more than what you do now? That's appropriate. Okay. So if you do nothing, it doesn't take much. 
You've been working out for years, it's gonna take a little bit more. But strength training, I can do on anybody. It is extremely moldable. I could shape it in any particular way I want. If I'm using bands and free weights in particular, doesn't matter how tall, short you are, doesn't matter how your body's built, the weights, the resistance follows you, not the other way around. So um, it's one of those forms of exercise that anybody could do. I can't say that about anything else, mm. right? Cycling, running, yoga, even swimming is inappropriate uh, for absolutely everybody. But strength training I can do, I mean, literally, you, you take somebody who's very, very, uh, let's say, um, deconditioned or in a state of needing rehab, simply trying to squeeze their hand with force would be a form um, of strength training. So, uh, and that makes it such a, 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 ver a valuable form of exercise. But yeah, when it comes to movement, all movement is healthy. The best way to apply movement just for movement's sake is to find ways to inject it into your everyday life. This is just going to be the most sustainable way um, that you end up uh, improving your health. The old, I used to scoff at this as, uh, as an early trainer. And I apologize to all those first clients that I had because I wasn't great at what I did. But people would say things like, oh, I, I try to park at the end of the parking lot. Or I try to take the stairs instead of the elevator. And I'd, oh, I'd laugh at that because you're not sweating. No, no. That's exactly what you should do on a daily basis is just find ways to do what you're going to do anyway, but move a little more. Okay. It could literally be, I'm watching TV for an hour. I'm going to stand for 20 minutes while I watch it. That's a little bit of extra movement. Uh, it could be parking further away. It could be taking the stairs instead of the elevator. It could be playing with your kids and rather than laying on the floor, you stand up and play with them. This is what I do, right? I'm a, I'm a dad in my mid forties. I have, uh, I have four kids, two real little ones. And I find myself sometimes at the end of the day, creating games that require me to lay on the floor cause I'm tired. Right. So <laughs> it's like a, it's like a dad hack when you're tired, but I get up and I say, you know what? I should, I should move, uh, stand up a little bit and get some extra activity. That's the best way, uh, to inject activity into your life. And then when you get to diet, boy, I'll tell you what, nobody approaches diet the right way. No one. Everybody gets stuck in the minutia of the what, you know, what macronutrient does what, and these foods do this, and that food does that, and you need to avoid this, and you get that. And everybody's forgetting the most important part when it comes to food. The thing that humans um, most are challenged with, the thing that connects us to food the most. It has nothing to do with calories, macros, and micronutrients. Nothing to do with that. It's all about our uh, our relationship with food. That's what food means to humans. It doesn't mean anything else. It does have macronutrients and nutrients, stuff like that. And luckily, we know what that is and we can study it. But humans have been eating food way before we understood that. It's about celebration. It's about how I feel. Um, it's about how it may numb me, distract me, make me present. It's how it, it's it's how we share um, community. It's how we connect with other people, and we ignore that. We focus all about all on the the ones and zeros, like we're robots. Here's your this is what you should eat. Plug this in and do it. It's not going to work that way. Mm. One uh, quick note about strength training, and then I'd love to move on to diet since you brought sure. it up. So you know, I think about like my my mom and my dad. You know, my dad. Uh, they're like my mom is about to turn seventy next year. My dad is like early 70, 73, I think. And they're really religious about walking mm. and they do a great job. You know, I got them both Apple watches. We kind of like track and just a rough proxy. And I nudge my mom a little bit. My dad is like a pro at it. He loves to rack up the steps. He lives in down in San Diego. He does a big morning walk in the morning, like loves to get up early and walks with his neighborhood friends. So it's like community time. It's a group of other men, a couple women, and they kind of go around this little loop. And he gets in probably before 6 a.m., 6.30. He's already at like you know, 15,000 steps, right? And then he usually loves to, just because he's a type of guy who likes to be out and about, he gets another like 10 to 15,000 steps on one or two other walks later in the day. Oh, that's great. Like really dialed in, you know? And I was chatting with my dad recently. I was like, dad, this is amazing. Like for sure. And this is the community component too. Awesome. And maybe just twice a week, give me like 30, 40 minutes we're going to have uh, my brother-in-law who's really in, into strength training and has been for a while. He's a cardiologist, Dr. Neil Patel, lives in San Diego. And my parents live down there with him and my sister. 
And I was like, we're going to take the trainer that Neil got for my nephew, right? They're just doing very like basic stuff. My mm. nephew's like 12 years old, you know, but they're getting the fundamentals of just awesome. like some training and, and just 30 to 40 minutes, even if you don't have the time. And I know my dad does, we can even just that day, you don't do one of your third walk, mm -hmm. right? Just give me that like 30 to 40 minutes and doing a little bit of strength training. Let's see how that goes for like a month, right? How does that make you feel? Does that make you feel excited? Do you feel more energy? Like, let's talk about it all. And he said, yes. And so we're basically starting this month and my mom getting her to join along is yeah. a little bit of a, like, you know, I kind of have to get a little bit more excited about it, but it just uh, goes back to this idea that I think my parents, uh, obviously all the walking is fantastic, right? It's, it's a great source of movement in their life. And genuinely from their standpoint, they being the age they are and just the media that they were exposed to, they thought like, wow, we're nailing it. And mm -hmm. they are definitely, they're getting way more steps than most people. But they thought like, that's kind of the epitome is like, how much can we walk inside of a day, right? Mm -hmm. And if we can blow past the 10,000 steps and get into the 20 and the 30,000, we're doing fantastic. But they kind of didn't hear the latest news, like a lot of us, including myself, I didn't get serious about this until a couple of years ago, that just a little bit of strength training could actually get them even more closer to some of their goals. Now at the age they're in, they want healthy longevity. They want, they want to be healthy. They want to be still active and excited for grandkids in the future and be able to do all the different components and put the bag on the, you know, airline above their head without needing help. And, um, and it's really been that it's like, just give me a little bit of time and that strength training, let's see how it goes. And I can imagine they're going to have the same experience I did is that you're just going to feel more activated in all aspects of your life. Yeah, hundred percent. There's a couple of ways that they could approach it too. You could do it that way, which is how most people would do it. A couple of days a week, uh, learn how to do it. You know, um, exercise is a skill or movement, I should say, is a skill. Strength training is no different. So when you do strength training exercises, don't view them like, um, this is going to work my legs. This is going to work my back. This is going to work my shoulders. So I have to feel those muscles, nothing necessarily wrong with that, but you're better off. If you look at the exercise, like a skill and say, I'm going to get better at squatting, or I'm going to get better at the skill of rowing, or I'm going to get the better at the skill of overhead pressing. For example, doing that is, is far better. You'll get more out of the exercises. You're more likely to do them appropriately. You're less likely to ignore negative signs that your body may be telling you. Cause a lot of people they'll do that, right? They'll go do squats and rather than being like, okay, this is a movement I need to perfect. It's like, well, can I make it feel, can I feel it in my legs? And can I do this as, as, mm. as many times as I can? So if you practice them like skills, you're going to do, you're going to be uh, way better off. So working with a trainer instructor is incredible when you first get started to learn the skills of these movements. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it. And there's not only there's, is there nothing wrong with what I'm about to say, it's probably more effective. Well, I think it's more effective from a behavioral standpoint, but it may even be, and we have some data now that's showing this, it may be even be more effective just in terms of results. So instead of doing, let's say, two 45 minute workouts a week, what if they did 12 or 15 minutes of strength training every day? I mean, same total time, if you did the math, right? I don't know if I did the math there, right? But if you did the, the same total time divided over every day versus just two days a week, would you get the same results? Yes, and I would argue probably even better. Mm. Let's talk about the behavioral uh, aspect of that. First off, developing a habit, you're more likely to develop a consistent habit if it's something you can repeat on a regular basis. You're also more likely to develop a habit if it's something that is easily injected into your day and you get you have a positive experience with it. It doesn't feel like it's too much. Taking 45 to 50 minutes out of your day twice a week doesn't sound like a lot, but for some people it's like, okay, Wednesday we got this thing we got to go to, and then we got this other thing we got to go to on Friday versus, oh, here's my 13 minute routine that I do in the morning or in the middle of the day or at night, and I do it every single day type of deal. But here's why it may actually be more effective in terms of results. The practice element that I just mentioned. So instead of, let's say, doing, you did, you know, six or seven sets of, let's say, body weight squats uh, between, let's say, Wednesday and, and, and Friday or Wednesday and Saturday, okay? What if I did, I don't know, a set or two every day? I'm going to learn that skill a little bit better. More I'll, at bats. More at bats. And I'm going to learn it a little bit better. 
I, I don't have to deal so much with fatigue. Here's what's interesting about strength training. A lot of people don't realize fatigue is your enemy when it comes to building muscle and strength. That's not the case when, when you're trying to build endurance. If I'm trying to build endurance, especially competitive endurance, well, I have to train and, and, and approach and train through fatigue, right? I have to train my body to learn how to be fatigued and to, uh, to fatigue at later points. I have to get better at that. With strength training, I'm just trying to get stronger. Fatigue actually gets in the way. Too much fatigue will make your strength training turn into endurance training. So like if I took five exercises uh, with weights and I did them all with no rest, like people like to do in a circuit, okay? That's not strength training. It's just cardio with weights, okay? Mm. Strength training requires rest periods. And to not, not to get too deep into the weeds, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to work with the anaerobic energy system of the body not the aerobic energy system of the body. The anaerobic uh, energy system, you know, I'm burning ATP. This is uh, the main source of energy for every cell, but it burns out very quickly. And then I move into, you know, glycolytic energy, right? Glycogen, okay? Um, nothing wrong with that, but if I'm trying to build strength, I want to train within, because strength is an anaerobic thing, okay? I want to train that anaerobic energy system. That's why if you watch strength athletes, they do a set, and then they rest for two or three minutes. And then mm. they do another set and then they rest, okay? When I divide my workouts uh, over the week, and in this case, we're using 10 to 15 minutes, even advanced athletes can do this. Instead of doing three workouts, you know, two hours uh, a day, they could do an hour a day, for example, or something like that. Um, I'm not as fatigued. I'm more, I'm training within that anaerobic phase uh, much more effectively. So now your dad, let's say, he wakes up and he does two sets of squats, maybe two sets of push-ups, a set of planks, and he's done. He's done in 15 minutes. And let's say the next day he does, I don't know, a couple sets of lunges, maybe he does some overhead presses, maybe he does some band rows, and then he's done. And he does something like that every single day, right? Some, some exercise that is training, let's say the lower body, some pushing and some pulling, maybe some rotation or something to strengthen the core. He does that every single day. He's going to get phenomenal results. He's going to feel like he's not even doing much at all. He's going to be like, this is, I don't know, I feel so great. I'm only doing 15 minutes. This is so strange. But he's going to get uh, gr great results from doing it. So that's that's the other approach. Myth that we're busting <laughs> definitively here on The Genius Live with Sal Stefano, the man, the myth, the legend. No carbs is best. Yeah. That a no carb diet is the best for weight loss. Yeah, for a very low carb diet. That low carb diets are superior for weight loss. No, they're not. It, it, for some people, they work well, but they're not superior. You know, it's funny. So when, when I was a kid, when I was younger, uh, fat was demonized. It was all about low fat, and it was and fat was what was making us fat. Fat was the obesity epidemic, and it was just it was it was all about fat. Fat was bad. Every health food was low fat back in those days. And then Atkins comes out uh, with his Atkins diet book and it blew up because specifically because it countered the narrative. It was so opposite from the narrative and people lost weight on it that people were like, oh, my God, I got to do this. You know, At Atkins is just a low calorie diet, just like the low fat diets were in the past. So you're going to lose weight on it, but it's so different. Right. So then this thing came out with, you know, this, this belief that it was carbs that was causing us uh, to get fat. And you'll find studies that show that, okay, carbohydrate intake in increased and there, that's the obesity epidemic kind of matches it. Really, I think it has more to do with heavily processed foods, which mm. um, many of which are made with carbohydrates. It's just easier to make processed food snacks. It's hard to find a processed food protein snack. Yeah, It's usually carbohydrates. So that's where you're getting that from. And there's studies on cultures that are very healthy that eat more carbohydrates um, and less fat than other cultures that eat higher fat and lower carbohydrates are also healthy. So um, I don't like to tell people low carb or no carb is the best because now we're putting people in this kind of restricted diet. The fail rate is so high. So I think it's more important. What's more important is to kind of identify what works best for you and what you like the most and what gives you the best digestion and the best energy. Now, that being said, I will say this. Most people I've worked with do better on a moderate to low carbohydrate diet. Okay, so most people I've worked with feel more satiated, have more balanced energy, and seem to get better results with a moderate to low carbohydrate diet. But that's not all of them. I've also worked with clients that do much better with a higher carbohydrate diet. Um, now, that being said, proteins and fats, you need to have a certain amount because they're essential. And protein, high protein, 
If your diet is higher in carb, low in carb, high protein works better uh, in both instances. You don't need that much fat though. Mm -hmm. I mean, like what, my, like observationally, I, I know that a lot of like bodybuilders tend to like dramatically cut the fat back. Yeah. Right. When they're, when they're in a cutting phase. Yeah. But they also, they're eating so many calories that they don't cut it down to past essential. Like you're, when you're, you're eating 5,000 calories and, and then you're dieting at 3,500 calories. Right. right. Um, fats also tend to be easy to come by because yeah. they tend to stick to proteins. So if you eat your meat. Your eggs, your you know, your dairy, that kind of stuff. You're gonna have those fats, and then, I mean, I fats for me, it's like olive oil. I mean, I put olive oil on 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 everything, and I eat full fat, um, you know, beef. I like to eat beef and Same. Uh, you know, grass fed beef and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's you know the the demonizing and macronutrient, you know, whether it's fat, carbs, protein, um, is such a a terrible approach. It doesn't really work that way. It's really about balance. What foods make you worse, be, worse, feel best, and whole and natural. Whole and natural is really the 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 commonality in any of these successful diets. Is are we eating? You know, if you look at all the healthy cultures of the world and you look at their diets, you'll find some commonalities and some things that are opposite. But the one commonality they all have is they all eat whole natural food diets. None of them are heavily processed food uh, based diets. Yeah. Also, I think when you say low carb, like low carb is relative, like low carb relative to the standard American diet. I mean, sure. that's not a that's not a ketogenic diet necessarily. No, ketogenic's like below thirty grams of protein. Yeah. I mean, excuse me, uh, thirty grams of carbohydrates. No, lower carb for my clients was around like one hundred and fifty, one hundred and twenty, something like that, depending yeah. on the total calories. I don't consume a ton of, ton of carbs personally. I probably stick to. 200 or less if i had to estimate i just feel better yeah that way um but i've identified that with myself and like i said i've had clients that feel way better with a lower fat higher carbohydrate diet they just their digestion was better and they had more energy yeah i i think that i eat probably what what uh could be described as a low carb diet but i still every day i eat like a a piece a piece or two of whole fruit um a couple of sweet potato wedges maybe for lunch mm -hmm. um yeah but uh, but it's not like a zero carb diet. Yeah, yeah, and you and you you eat in ways that make you feel good. Yeah, I mean, if it felt better to eat more of the fruit or whatever, you would move in that direction. Yeah, that's basically my point. My point is because I've had people, literally, I mean, I'll, I mean, literally, I've had people come up to me like, "Hey, I'm doing that ketogenic diet. I've been on it for four months, and uh, you know, I got that keto flu." And I'm constipated. Like, when does that go away? I'm like, it's four months. <laughs> this isn't working for you. Like, you, you got to listen to your body. This is not the diet for you. And, and that's my point with it is that if we say it's no carb or low carb and people believe that, they ignore the signals that their body's telling them and they stick on this particular, these parameters. And then eventually they, they go off and they rebel. Fascinating. Yeah. I love, I mean, I try not to eat, you know, too much added fats other than the extra virgin olive oil mm -hmm. and i definitely enjoy the fattier cuts of meat on occasion even though i actually you know i enjoy the fatty cuts of meat but i know that it's probably well then i i know that it is healthier to stick to the leaner cuts more frequently yeah have you, you know? noticed um when you do go off and let's say you'll eat something that's processed or whatever have you because you're so in tune right have you noticed like how it affects your body and your cravings and you ever trip over that yeah, I I mean I could I could definitely tell with my digestion, you know, cuz my digestion is pretty good, but if I eat something hyper processed the next day, <laughs> you know, pretty much I'm uh, I'm feeling it. Um I find myself um I eat it faster and then I find myself thinking about the bite that's not even in my hand. Oh, definitely. So I'm like and I and I you know, I've become aware of it a few times cuz I'll do it. I'll, sometimes I'll go and I'll eat like my I love potato chips, so I'll eat potato chips some, you know, rarely. I don't buy them cuz that's a food that I'll overeat for sure. Um Candy, you know, I've had candy, you know, sometimes I'd say probably, you know, a couple times a month. And when I eat them, I like, I like gummy candy. So if I have gummy and I'll find myself like thinking about this one, not the one that's in my mouth. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll stop and be like, oh, this is a drug. Yeah. <laughs> They've engineered the shit out of this, man. It's insane. A lot of the uh, stuff that I like, one of the things that I was like most recently obsessed with was this um, white chocolate by, uh, it was like a keto white chocolate. Oh. It was delicious by a company called Evolved. It's really, really freaking tasty. They nailed the white chocolate, mm -hmm. keto, dairy-free, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I would notice, because uh, when I like something, I like to just like drown myself in it. That's just <laughs> how I, it's not, you know, it's not, 
It's not that You're I, a human. That's why. That's, I'm a yes, exactly. I see. I think that these foods are like. I think it's weird to not want to mm-hmm. overeat these foods, right? Like the, the idea that we should be able to eat these foods in moderation to me is like it's like advice that is just like not in synchrony with how our biology and our psychology work, right? You're going to be playing this um this 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 game of willpower is what ends up happening. Yeah, that's why I don't have it in my house. This is what I used to tell clients is I used to say, look, I know you enjoy, I don't know, whatever, chocolate. Um, And I don't want to tell you not to eat it. It's something in life you enjoy and you you derive pleasure from it. Eat the chocolate. Just don't have in your house. Yeah. So if you want it, you go to the store and you buy yourself some and then you eat it and then it's gone. Um, You know, you create that barrier, right? That buffer between you and that impulse. So, I mean, that's why, like I said, that's why I don't have potato. If I have potato chips in my house, like let's say if we throw a party and my wife will go and she'll buy chips you know whatever tortilla chips or potato chips because we have you know family and friends and stuff over and if there's leftover chips i find myself i walk i find myself walking the pantry Hmm. and getting more and more and identify so i just don't have them in the house because otherwise i'm playing this game of willpower like why would i want to do that i like when snacks come in already portion control yeah that's good uh packages it might not be as smart for the environment but I don't care. Yeah. It makes it easier for me to moderate my consumption of these foods that are not designed to be consumed in moderation. Mm-hmm. You know, so when it's like, if it's ice cream, I like the ice cream like on a stick pops or yeah, whatever yeah, they're yeah, called yeah, yeah. because it's like, that's 120 calories right there that I know I'm not going to over, over consume. I'm mm-hmm. not going to go past that, you know, or like uh, if it's a bag of chips, I like the smaller bags of chips because I know I can just eat the whole, I can eat the bag and mentally it's a much bigger hurdle for me to like, I'm not going to let myself eat two bags of chips. Yeah. It, 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 well, it's, it's a barrier between you and the impulse. Yeah. Because if it's right in front of you and there's no barrier, the impulse continues. Um, that's what it turns in. That's what I meant when I said I was eating the, the gummy candy and I was thinking about the net. It, was, it became impulsive. Um, uh, so I tell people, so you can either buy individually packaged or you could get yourself little, so if you if you want to you know, be good with the environment, you could buy yourself little serving Tupperwares, mm. put in your servings, put them in the cupboard. Put the big container of the thing somewhere that's not as easily accessible. And so then you go in and you grab your little Tupperware and you eat it and then it's done. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. What else like do you see in the fitness, like in the online <laughs> fitness space that really like gets you, uh, you know, that really, uh, you know, bothers you? Because there's, a, I feel like there's a lot of misinformation. Um, and uh, yeah, well, in, in my, my space is very interesting. Because it's um, a lot of people who have a lot of popularity and who have big voices tend to because they look really, really good. And um, a lot of them look really good because they're very obsessive. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of it's based on insecurities. That's why I started working out. So, uh, and by the way, I don't want to make anybody feel bad. We all have our issues. So I, I totally get it. But because they get so much attention, their voices come out and they tend to promote things that um, like um, like the hype and motivation you know, stuff. Uh, there's nothing wrong with motivation, but um, really attaching yourself to that feeling and depending on that feeling is a losing strategy because it goes away. Mm. It doesn't stay with you forever. So picking workouts that are hype and motivated and exciting, and that's what I'm always looking for, doesn't allow you, or at least, you you know, it's not encouraging you to develop the skills and behaviors that allow you to stick around when the motivation goes away. So in in in, in the fitness space, you see a lot of that hype a lot of that crush it and beast mode and, you know, you just do it anyway and don't stop and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And that's because they like that stuff. Yeah. But when you communicate that to the average person, it tends to contribute to on, off, on, off. So I'm working out. I lost my motivation. I'm done. And I'm hyped again. And then I'm done. And it's this on, off uh, type of thing. Another uh, big myth or or lie is the, is the weight loss one in the sense that, okay, so I'll tell you a story that's uh, really interesting. So this actually happened to Adam, um, and I'll, I'll tell his story because I thought I think it illustrates it so well. So when he managed, there was a there was a gym that he managed, and he had like thirty trainers under him, and they all did a contest amongst the trainers. Let's see who could drop the most body fat in I think it was like two months or something like that. And he had set up a deal with a underwater weighing company, so they drive a truck to you. And they would do a dunk test, which is the most accurate way of measuring body fat. Interesting. It's very consistent, right? How so does it work? You've never done it before? No. Okay. So there's different ways to test body fat. There's body fat caliper. Okay. Then there's electronic impedance, like you hold the device in it, right? Um, and then there's underwater weighing. Underwater weighing is the most accurate because they'll weigh your body uh, outside the water, then in the water. And because they know what the buoyancy is of fat, they can subtract it. 
And it's not a, there's nothing that's 100% accurate, but it's as accurate as you can get. Wow. And so they, what they do is they put you in this like harness and you breathe all the air out of your lungs and you go under wa- under the water and then they weigh you. <laughs> so it's kind of claustrophobic, actually, if you if you have ever gone under water with no air in your, in your lungs. It's <laughs> kind of weird. It sounds scary. But anyway, so the, he had this, this setup with this company that would come and they would come and test the trainers as part of this contest. So they came and tested them. Everybody had their baseline. And then they did this big con- – I don't remember what the award was. It was like this big thing. Well, anyway, they got they got tested again, and a lot of the trainers' body fat percentage went up, and they were pissed. They're like, this machine is broken. These guys are full of crap or whatever. Why were they so pissed? Because they lost weight. They lost weight on the scale, but their body fat percentage went up. How is this possible? Here, here's, what, here's what's happening here. If you weigh 200 pounds and you have 40 pounds of body fat on your 200-pound frame, that is how much body – what's your body fat percentage? 20%. Right, twenty percent of your body is body fat. If you lose ten pounds, or let's say you lose twenty pounds, and you go down to one hundred eighty pounds, but you have the same amount of body fat on your body, forty pounds, that now has become a larger percentage of your body weight. Yeah, and body fat percentage is what matters, not your total amount, right? Because a, a, a two hundred fifty pound muscular man can have way more body fat on his body and be shredded than a you know one hundred pound man type of deal. So they lost weight. But their body fat percentage went up. Now, why'd that happen? Because they aggressively cut their calories and did a ton of cardio and made their bodies become more endurance based, which made them lose muscle. They lost muscle. They lost muscle. Wow. So they lost 10 pounds, but seven was muscle and three was body fat and their Damn. body fat percentage went up. This happens to people all the time. They'll lose weight on the scale and not realize that a good chunk of that was muscle. And now they're sitting at a lighter body weight same similar body fat percentage, maybe higher body fat percentage with a slower metabolism Hmm. with less muscle. And they set themselves up for really unsustainable future by doing something like that. Now to preserve muscle when dieting, you want to correct me if I'm wrong, but this is just sort of like, you know, from a 30,000 foot uh, view, what I, what I believe to be true. You want to create a calorie deficit, but you don't want it to be too extreme, right? You want it to be maybe about 500 calories a day. Is, yeah. that, is that a general? Depending on the amount of calories you're consuming, um, if you have a lower, if your metabolism much faster, you could cut more. If it's much slower, you you could cut less. Got so if, if you're not, I mean, if you if you have to go down to 1,300 calories, um, you don't want to go. You know, I don't like to take people below. I don't like people going below 1,500 calories hmm. um, when they diet. I like to try and build their metabolisms up before I cut them down because I want them to come to a place that they can maintain. Got it. Right. Um, but yeah, you don't want to you don't want to cut too much, too much, because then you risk muscle loss, right? You do because, and it's not that your body burns muscle; it's not burning muscle; it's just paring it down. It's paring the muscle down to slow your metabolism down to match the energy intake. Got so it. it's trying to energy output, trying to match the energy because your body intake. wants to survive. Correct. Right. Correct. So don't cut too much. Lift weights. That's very important. You have to give your body a reason to have muscle. Yeah. I've heard that you don't want to change your workouts. The same workout that you would do to optimally put on muscle is the same kind of workout that you want to do when you're in a calorie deficit because it's going to be the best workout that preserves muscle. Yeah. All strength training should be geared towards building muscle. And it doesn't matter if you want to lose weight, gain weight, what your diet, uh, you know, how you're moving your diet because – the workout that builds the, the that is the most effective at building muscle is going to be the one that's going to be the most effective at preserving it. Got it. When you're losing weight, so Love you want to lift weights or do strength training of some type. So your body weight bands, machines, weights, strength training. Don't cut too much. And here's the third part: high protein. Keep the protein high. Keep the protein really high. And the lower the 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 bigger the cut, the greater you, the higher in that range I gave you of 0.6 to 0.8 protein you want. In fact, some people see results. Or better results going as high as a gram of protein uh, per pound of body weight. So you just want to bring you just want to bring the carbs and fat down. Because carbs and fat are energy. Yes, carbs and fats, and because fats are essential, uh, at some point, then it's usually mostly carbohydrates. But I, like I said, I don't like to keep people get people's calories too low. I like to see men cut uh, no lower than 18, 19 hundred calories, and I don't like to see women cut with anything lower than like fifty. If I have to go down lower than those numbers. Then what I'll typically say is, okay, let's let's try to build your metabolism because we're going to end up in a place that's not going to be very sustainable. We might get the weight loss, but now you're going to be sitting at 1,200 calories and um, your maintenance is at 1,500 afterwards and then what? Yeah. Is there like a formula that can help people determine 
ballpark their their maintenance calorie needs. Yeah, uh, that's a yeah. I wish I you know. I feel like there is a ca- I think there is a ca- calculator at the NIH website somewhere. Yeah, we have one too. We have one on uh, mapsmacro.com, but it's a general um, estimation. The best the best way that I found is to track your calories over a two week period. See what you normally eat, and if you don't gain or lose weight, then it's probably around there. But really, just monitor how you feel, uh, monitor your performance, and then you can test your um, you can get your body fat tested. You know, once every three or four weeks to see if the weight loss on the scale is body fat or muscle. Sometimes, but you can also gain weight and get leaner, right? So if your if your body fat stays the same, but you gain five pounds of muscle, your body fat percentage is now mm. uh, gone down. So body fat percentage tests are pretty good. The electronic impedance ones are the most convenient. Because you could just buy a device on Amazon, and you, usually it's with your hands or your feet. The only thing with those, um, and I'll caution people, is those can be very, they can vary dramatically based on your water intake, food intake of the day, time of day. So if you do an electronic impedance and test, uh, do impedance test, excuse me, do it at the same time every day, same like. So I like to do like first thing in the morning, after a glass of water. Um, and you know, same time that way you can get at least some consistency and then don't, don't freak out over one or two percentages. Just look at the trends. So Mm. is it, Oh, is it trending up? Is it trending down? That'll give you a good idea. Super helpful. What do you think when people say that a calorie isn't a calorie or a calorie is a calorie? Like there's this debate, right? (laughs) What? Well, there's a, so there's, it's really interesting because I'm obviously of the camp that argues that calories aren't all that matter, although they do matter, absolutely, right? But then sometimes you'll see on social media, people will say, that's right, a calorie isn't a calorie. But I think it requires, um, and those are usually the people that are on my side, right? (laughs) But I think it requires a little bit of uh, clarity so that people really are able to communicate uh, the utility of calories um, accurately, right? Yeah. So it's important for people to know that a calorie is a calorie because a calorie yeah, is a unit of measurement, exists. right? It's yeah. like the same way that like a mile is a mile. Right. You can walk a mile uphill. You can walk a mile downhill. They're both a mile, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's much more difficult to walk uphill as compared to downhill. Um, but a calorie is essentially a calorie, right? It is. It's it, it exists. It's real, and it's a calorie. But I do get the whole a calorie is not a calorie um, side because of how the metabolism adapts on a on a you know, hour by hour basis. And so people will notice, hey, but the same calories don't do the same thing with me anymore. Well, it's not the calories that changed. It was the output part that changed because your body's, you know, constantly monitoring and and, and modifying and adapting that. So there's that. There's also this. When you look at foods and you look at the calorie content, they're allowed to be 10% off. That's right. So, you know, a 400 calorie, you know, snack or food could be as high as 440 calories. Um, that doesn't sound like much, but it adds up if that's how you eat, you know, every single day or you or you eat two meals and one's off by 10%. So is the other one. So, yeah. so I get that. It's also when people go, and the apps are pretty good now, but I double check the app because a medium banana is not what people typically think a medium banana is. Interesting. Yeah, okay. So I, I remember doing this years ago. So back in the day before we had apps and stuff, we used to have this, this calorie king book. And this is how we would, you know, work with clients and we'd show them this is, you know, a sweet potato, this is whatever. And I remember in there it said um, large sweet potato. And I think it was like 70 grams of carbohydrates or 60 grams of carbohydrates. I don't remember how much it weighed, but it was a, like a unit of, of weight. And I remember being like, I wonder how much this large sweet potato I have weighs. And I weigh, it was like almost twice as heavy <laughs> as what the book said. So I'm like, okay, I got to go off the weight. Do you notice that our food is getting bigger? Way bigger. It's insane. Wait, we've bred it to be. You ever look at pictures? You ever look at old paintings of fruit? Oh, it's insane. Have you seen that? Yeah. I've seen some. I've seen like they're, they're like the old watermelon. Yeah. It's like yeah. all rind and yeah. seeds. Yeah. We've... The cra- if you look at a crab apple, that was like the OG apple. Yeah. Dude, there are honey crisps uh, and I love honey crisp apples, but sometimes you get them. They're the size of my freaking head. Yeah. They're massive. We've done a really good job of um, of breeding and changing our food to suit our our needs and desires. Our needs and... Have you seen pictures of chickens? No. Oh, you haven't seen... Look at chickens from the 1950s. The ones that we have today are pro bodybuilder versions of the old. <laughs> oh, they're huge. Damn. They're all 
they're all breast. Wow. And just, they look like dinosaurs compared to the old chickens. They probably can't even walk. I mean, these poor chickens. Oh, they just, they, they look so different. Um, you know, a lot of our foods change because of the breeding. So if you want to be accurate with, you know, calories and stuff, you probably have to weigh. Plus people don't really have a good idea. Like you say six ounces of chicken and someone, most people have no idea what that looks like. And they'll say, oh, that looks like six ounces. We'll weigh it and get an idea. So that next time you have a more accurate you know, idea of what six ounces looks like. Yeah, everybody, sh I think, should have a food scale. Yeah. Hey, sorry to interrupt. We have a free guide titled Understanding Your Mood, Stress, and Sleep. It tackles all of those things from a health and longevity perspective. It's a totally, totally free guide. So just click on the link at the top of the description below. And yeah. like just audit things every now and then. I do it. You know, like what the Greek yogurt, like snack before bed that I was mm -hmm. telling you about. I like, I buy, I mean, I buy, I buy a Greek, I buy the, like big, the big jar, yeah. No, it's not. It's like uh, whatever. It's like it's got multiple um, servings, multiple servings. Yes. And um, and, you know, I don't want to just eyeball it. I want to know like what a serving is. I yeah. want to know what I'm eating. So I like weigh it on the freaking scale. You know, and it's not that I'm like obsessing over like I've got to get it just right. Sometimes it's over under. But I want to make I want to know what a serving is. Yeah. And you can eyeball it after that. Once yeah. you get a good idea. Yeah. yeah. There's um, everybody. Should, everybody should have a scale. Yeah. I don't know if I've talked about this on your show that the four stages of learning, this is true for anything, but, um, they, it starts with unconscious incompetence. I mean, you just don't know what you don't know. A lot of people are there when it comes to, to foods. So you, you, once you start to learn about foods, like for example, if you're listening to the podcast, this podcast, you may be moving into the second stage, which is now conscious incompetence. So now you're like, Oh, I don't know all this stuff. I probably should weigh that apple or, you know, I didn't know there was a 10%, you know, that it could be 10% higher in calories that the FDA allows for or whatever. Like now you're consciously incompetent. And then what you do is you start to pay attention and you start to modify things. And that's the third stage, which is conscious competence. But when you do that and you practice it, what you want to move to is the fourth stage, which is unconscious competence, where it just becomes stress-free. Because if you get stuck in the weighing and measuring, which we've talked about many times, that is a stressful way to live. And nobody wants to do that all the time. But I think if you if you measure, if you weigh eight ounces of steak, six ounces of chicken, you know, what is a handful of nuts? How much does that weigh? What is that supposed to be considered? Like, what is a serving of this? Weigh it, get an idea, do that a few times. Then you can eyeball it uh, on your own and you'll. it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, super important. I mean, I've been doing, I do like heavy cream in my coffee in the morning and I'm making sure that I'm putting like a tablespoon in it just so I know, you know, because the difference between a tablespoon and two tablespoons is like almost 100 calories. You ever seen what people consider like a tablespoon of peanut butter? Oh, yeah. It's, oh, it's, it's, it's like yeah. four tablespoons. <laughs> I was that guy. <laughs> you really? I'm like, that's a tablespoon, right? <laughs> no, that's not a tablespoon. That's like four. How do you feel with the heavy cream in your with your caffeine? Do you notice the caffeine's a little bit more smooth? I love it, dude. I think it tastes great. I, I think that there's a strong argument to be made for if you're if you're a coffee drinker, you don't have to be a coffee drinker. And you know, if you're dairy sensitive, um, you know, maybe coconut, maybe don't do it. Yeah, but also like heavy cream has virtually no fat. I'm sorry, it does have fat. It has virtually no carbohydrates and no protein in mm -hmm. it. So it's got no casein. If you're casein sensitive, it shouldn't really have any lactose. Maybe trace lactose. Mm -hmm. You know. But um, I've used it before. Yeah. Um, caffeine. Uh, if you pair caffeine with a fat. Yeah. You tend to get a more sustained. You don't get the spike and crash as much as you get uh, when you consume it with a fat. That's why the bulletproof coffee became. I think a lot of people really enjoyed it because they noticed that the energy lasted a little longer. Yeah. It was the fat that was in there. Exactly. And yeah. I think bulletproof coffee is delicious. However, I don't think that butter is uh, I've, I've relegated butter to more of an adult indulgence food, like a yellow food. Oh, really? Yeah, because I, it's the lack of milk fat globule membrane, oh. which we might have talked about when no, I was on, I didn't on know your this. show. Yeah, when you could feed two, you could feed, feed people heavy cream and butter. Butter is just churned cream, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll see an adverse effect on lipids after the butter feeding as compared to- I the, did not know that. As compared to- And what does it have to do with? It's called milk fat globule membrane. Oh, interesting. So basically what it is, is that milk is similar to blood in the sense that it's mostly water. And you've got these droplets of fats that are perfectly suspended within the mostly aqueous solution, right? Mm -hmm. So na Mother Nature is brilliant, right? It's devised what are essentially lipoproteins. Like you've heard of like LDL lipoprotein, yeah, yeah. right? It keeps like the fats in your blood soluble mm -hmm. in the solution that is mostly water, which is your blood, right? So similarly in milk, you've got all these fats, right? that are encapsulated by this lipoprotein called milk fat globule membrane, which is like this complex 
of phospholipids and sphingomyelin, actually compounds that are really good for the brain. Mm. So I have this theory that milk fat actually is, is particularly supportive of brain health. Because if you think about like a neonate, right, mm. the brain is under rapid yeah, yeah, yeah. growth and development. Wow. And so I think that dairy is actually this like if you if you part well, if you're a kid, you obviously are um you you produce the lactase enzyme. Right. So I think it I think it actually is a very healthy food. I've come around like on dairy. I used oh, to dairy is uh, if you can tolerate, you know, if you don't have an intolerance to it, it's one of the most nutrient dense, healthy food. And it's the full fat versions. Yeah. That are that, you know, tend to be the best. Yeah. Uh, what about the um, what about eggs for brain development? It's really good. Right. Because of the choline and the nutrients. Because I, I yeah. have my baby son. He eats. It's funny. He has a slight intolerance to egg whites. So every morning he eats a, a three yolk scramble. Interesting. And uh, well, I mean, people that have egg sensitivity, it's going to be to the egg white. Usually, right? Yeah, it's yeah. not going to be to the egg yolk. And egg yolk is like a it's like a cognitive multivitamin. Is oh what yeah. I consider it. Are they considering choline essential yet? It's conditionally essential. Okay. It's conditionally essential. So you have to eat it, but you it's not technically essential because we do manufacture in our own bodies mm -hmm. a little bit of choline. But we definitely need it. It used to be considered a, a vitamin. Yeah, you talk about uh, you. You were earlier talking about your favorite high protein snack. For me, it's just boiled eggs. I'll have boiled eggs in the fridge, and it's a very easy six or seven grams of protein. Put a little salt on it, and nothing makes me feel better than eggs. Wow. And from a performance standpoint, when I eat, I probably will average uh, eight to twelve eggs a day, and um, and I notice a big difference in strength and, and muscle performance when I go from that down to like no eggs, like if I go on vacation or something like that. You're eating almost a dozen eggs a day. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Every day. You should see my cholesterol numbers. They're they're my, my the, when I do my cholesterol, my doctors are always like, "This is the best profile I've ever seen." Wow. And then I, I tell them I eat like ten eggs a day. You guys hear that? That's <laughs> that's freaking awesome, <laughs> yeah. dude. Yeah. Amazing. But wait, I was going to say something about coffee that I think is also really interesting because I, I mm -hmm. looked into this that. Um, Another benefit of putting heavy cream in your coffee is that uh, coffee, you know, is one of America's top sources of polyphenols, yeah. right? And these compounds are fat soluble. So actually, if you're oh. if you're ingesting coffee on an empty stomach in the morning, which I used to do, and you know, I used to get like sure. jitters from the caffeine infusion. So the, the adding the fat to the coffee helps with that as well. I feel better mm -hmm. when I drink it. But also, you're making a lot of these like uh, phytochemicals in coffee more bioavailable. Oh, just like having a fat soluble vitamin with, yeah. with some fat. But um, but whole milk does this as well, right? And and half and half to some degree does mm -hmm. this as well. However, um, milk proteins have been shown to interfere with the absorption of those same compounds. So what's great about heavy cream is that it doesn't have any protein in it, but it has fat that makes those compounds more uh, wow. more bioavailable, and it doesn't hinder their uh, your access to them the way that wow. milk protein. Wow. Will. You know, I also, I saw your post on caffeine, speaking of coffee and its health effects on the liver. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about that. So years ago, years ago, um, I had got real deep into just reading on cancer and this, and I had found studies that showed that caffeine and coffee reduces liver cancer hmm. risks. Um, and then you talked about that pathway that caffeine seems to work with in terms of improving health of the liver. And I was like, yeah. that's probably what it is. Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, it acts like a natural PCSK9 inhibitor, which is this new family of cholesterol lowering drugs. They're called PCSK9 inhibitors. When you inhibit this protein piece, PCSK9, it increases availability of the LDL receptor on the liver, which is this receptor that bobs up to the surface of the liver that sucks in like ApoB containing lipoproteins, like your LDL cholesterol, you know, and it, it sucks them in dismantles them, uses cholesterol to create bile acids wow. and the like. But so it makes your liver a more efficient cholesterol recycling machine. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's phenomenal. Do you take the, do the dose was very high in that study that where we discovered this. It was like 400 milligrams of caffeine or sure. something like that. But like conceivably, you know, unless there's like a threshold effect, caffeine is good. It is. Yeah, that's an individual thing, right? For some people, it can cause a lot of uh, I'll, I'll do about 300 a day on average is what my caffeine intake. Do you combine do you take theanine with your caffeine? I did. I was for at a certain point, but it's not, uh, does it, does it make a difference for you? Well, no, the, the issue is that theanine doesn't like, it doesn't stir in easily. Like I haven't found a, a, a theanine that stirs in, so oh. I have to blend it and I oh, just no. want to no, take the capsule. Oh yeah, I could do that. 
<laughs> what are you putting in? Like, it tastes gross. I'm just, so, I'm always thinking about because everybody's trying to like engineer their coffee yeah. to be some kind of like. No, yeah, you're right. No, I, I literally have a little tray because we have an espresso machine. My wife has it every That's morning. Smart, yeah. Yeah, do we that. have a little tray of theanine, and you just take your. Oh wow. Yeah, 200 milligrams of theanine with with uh, your espresso. Or, what does that do? What is that? Oh, it balances out the the feel. So I I love. So here's the the I don't know what you want to call it the unhealthy side of me. I really enjoy taking substances and supplements. And I say substances, I don't mean illegal, maybe, <laughs> but usually not. But I really enjoy um, modulating how I feel and, you know, how am I going to feel in my workouts or I'm going to write a blog or I'm going to work on a book or whatever. So uh, caffeine with theanine, I get this really, and the studies will show this, you get this really nice, you get more euphoric feeling from the caffeine and it lasts longer. And then for people who are prone to anxiety from caffeine, it, it's, uh, it lowers it. There are a lot of different ways to accomplish improvements in all of those areas. In other words, there's a lot of different ways to exercise. There are a lot of different ways to improve your nutrition. And all of them can provide value. Someone might be like, well, what's the one? Like, which one do I pick? Like, how do I know, you know, what's going to be right? Well, what we got to do is we got to look at why people fail the most or what is it about every exercise modality, every way that people try to improve the nutrition. Why do people fail at such a high rate? Okay, let's look at that. So the numbers show us that when a person goes on a diet or a person goes on a, a fitness journey or a weight loss journey, you're looking at a fail rate uh, north of 85%. And this is within the first couple of years. If you stretch that out to five years, it's probably over 90%. So super high fail rate. Basically, if you look at the numbers, you're probably going to fail. And so you got to look at that and go, well, what's going on here? Well, why do people fail so often? And the main reason is not necessarily because they are... Now, these are all factors that are true, but these aren't the main reasons as to why people fail. People say, well, it's, is it the workout program? Is it the type of diet? Is it the types of foods that they're eating? Somewhat. But the main thing that we need to understand is that exercise, so long as it's not done inappropriately. In other words, so long as you're not overdoing it or hurting yourself, you will gain benefit from, okay? So the main reason why they fail is because people stop. Of course, you know, the you know, people will say, "Well, duh. Yeah, well, okay, well why are people <laughs> why are people stopping?" By the way, I want to make something very clear here. The exercise program, and again, this is uh, considering it's appropriate. So you're not hurting yourself, you're not overdoing it, right? It's appropriately applied. The exercise program and the nutrition nutritional changes that you can stick to are going to be the most effective. Let that sink in for a second. The workout program that you do forever is going to outperform any other workout program that you end up stopping. Even if those other workout programs on paper or physiologically speaking are superior. In other words, if I had two workout programs and on a scale of one to 10, this one's a 10 in terms of just effectiveness and this one's a five in terms of effectiveness, but the 10 workout program, I don't do, I stop. And the five is the one that I continue for the rest of my life. Well, which one's the most effective, right? It's going to be the one that you end up sticking to. So what we need to do really is look at our behaviors and figure out what it is that's making people stop and reverse out. And one of the main reasons for stopping and reversing out, there's a few of them, but one of them is how we set our goals, and the mindset that we have going into setting our goals. So let's talk about that for a second. The first part is how we set our goals. Now, usually, especially at the beginning of the year, especially around January time, and you know this, you work in gyms. You know, when I would manage big box gyms, we could expect a, at least a 50% increase in traffic, at least in January. Sometimes it would be 100% increase in traffic. So you're looking at, it's like the mall around Christmas time. Like if you go right now, like if you were to go shopping before Christmas at the mall, it's just packed, right? Versus other times of the year. Well, gyms are like that, in, you know, January and February, they're just packed with people showing up. And usually when people first start working out, and this is true at any point, but definitely at the beginning of the year, is we're doing it through this kind of motivated state of mind. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you set a goal, in that motivated state of mind, we tend to subconsciously assume that we're always going to feel that same feeling of motivation. So it's like, that's it. I'm going to start working out. I haven't, I'm not working out at all right now. I'm going to go to the gym four days a week. And I've been eating like crap. 
So that's it. I'm going to eliminate all carbs and sugar out of my diet, and I'm going to reduce my calories by whatever, right? So it's like these really lot, like big changes, and you feel good about it because you're super motivated. But then eventually that motivated state of mind tends to go away because it's a state of mind. Like we're not in the same state of mind all the time. And when that motivated state of mind fades, which it will, you no longer can maintain those you know, crazy goals. And then we tend to fail. And then we're like, what's the use? So the first thing you want to do is you want to set yourself up with small goals. And you want to ask yourself, is what it takes to get this particular goal? So let's say my first goal is I want to lose five pounds. So let's say ultimately my goal is to lose 40 pounds, right? But I'm going to lose five pounds first. Let's see, what can I do to move towards that five pound weight loss? Make sure you ask yourself, is this a change that I can maintain for the rest of my life? So whatever I'm about to do, would I, and you have to be honest with yourself, be able to maintain this when I'm low energy, when I have no motivation, those days I come home from work and I just want to watch TV, those days I feel stressed out, like kind of put yourself there, take yourself outside of your, your current state of mind, which is super motivated, and say, is this something that I can do for the rest of my life? And if the answer is yes, then start there. If the answer is no, don't start there, no matter what, because you're just going to set yourself up for failure. By the way, there is no wrong answer here. So it can be, you know, I'm going to drink an extra glass of water, or I'm going to start by walking five minutes every night. You know, it could be tiny. It doesn't matter. Start there. And then what you want to do is you want to follow that until it feels like a habit, until it feels like it's a part of your lifestyle and a part of your routine. Like it's not really something you have to think about anymore. There's really no challenge to it. You appreciate it. And then you ask yourself that same question. What's the next step I can take that I think is going to be realistic for me forever? And, and what happens when you do this, by the way, is the first step tends to be the smallest. Each successive step tends to be a little bit bigger, and the space between those changes tends to shrink because we start to develop this kind of skill of discipline, and we start to develop this feeling of confidence. We start to build these little wins, okay? So, you know, to walk you through it, it's like, okay, I want to lose 50 pounds. Right now, I'm not exercising at all. Right now, I am not watching what I'm eating at all. So let me see here. I'm really motivated, but I heard Sal on a podcast say I should start with, you know, something I think is realistic forever. So let me think. I want to go to the gym three days a week. And then I got to ask myself, okay, is that realistic forever? Like, nah, it's definitely not. I'm, I'm probably going to give up at some point. What about two days a week? No, that's still too much. What about one day a week? For the rest of my life, right now, maybe. All right, well, let me start with this. 15 minutes of walking every night. Do I think I could do that for the rest of my life realistically? And then I say, okay, yeah, I think I can. I think I can. Let me start with that. And then you do that. And then you're like, wow, this is great. I enjoy it. This feels easy. What's the next thing I can do? And then you go from there. And what ends up happening is this trajectory becomes more and more pronounced and the results, of course, follow, right? So that's the first you know, big thing is when you, you, you can have a big goal, but make sure you break it up into smaller goals. And then you want to make changes that are things that you feel like, I think I can stick to this forever. And that's going to lead you, your, your odds of success are tremendously higher doing it that way. The second thing is you want to look deep into the root cause of your new motivation or the driver of this current motivation. Is it coming from a place of negativity or is it coming from a place of positivity? This makes a profound difference. So a place of negativity would be something like this. I want to lose 50 pounds because I'm fat and unattractive. I want to lose 50 pounds because I, I, I feel gross. I want to lose 50 pounds because I'm lazy. I want to lose 50 pounds because I don't look good. Okay, those are all places of negativity. Here are, the place, here are some positive drivers of motivation. I want to lose 50 pounds because I deserve to feel good. I want to lose 50 pounds because, man, I know what? I, I want to take care of myself because I deserve to be taken care of. I want to lose 50 pounds because I want to feel good. Not I don't want to feel bad, but I want to feel good. Okay, now why is that important? Because here's what happens. If I'm motivated from a negative place, then the changes that I make, all the steps I'm going to take to get to the goal, if it's coming from a negative motivation standpoint, all those changes now become 
negatively driven. In other words, to be more specific, exercise is a punishment. Exercise is I'm going to beat myself up. So if I say I want to lose 50 pounds because I'm unattractive and gross, when I'm going to the gym, it's like this kind of angry, negative, like sweat it out. Get this fat off me. I hate this, okay? When I'm changing my diet, it is not self-care, but rather restrictive. No, I'm, I can't eat that cookie because I'm fat. No, I can't eat this much food because I'm unattractive, okay? Now, why is that ineffective? Because nobody is going to maintain this self-hate state of mind forever. At some point, what's going to happen is you're going to rebel from this negative state of mind, and you're going to, and the rebellion is going to look like this. You know what? I'm not going to go to the gym. I just want to enjoy my life. Like, workouts suck. Or, you know what? I'm going to eat that pizza because I just want to have fun. And eating the way I did before, man, it was miserable. It sucked. Okay? Now, if we look at the other end of this, and it's coming from this kind of positive perspective, well, now working out is self-care. Now I'm going to the gym, and I'm not like punishing myself, but rather taking care of myself. When I'm looking at diet, I'm not restricting myself. I'm caring for myself. So it's not, I can't eat that cookie because I'm unattractive. It's, I don't want that cookie because that's not taking care of me, okay? The positive viewpoint also leads to balance. So people always hear, you know, like you need to have balance in your life, have balance in your life. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means when I'm honest, when I'm honestly caring for myself and it's coming from a good place, there are going to be those occasions where caring for yourself, especially from, like I said, a, a true standpoint, is going to be eating a cookie or caring for myself is going to be taking a day off from the gym because maybe I am too tired. Maybe I am, maybe I did get poor sleep or maybe I do feel a little sick or maybe I'm hanging out with my friends and we're having this incredible conversation and I'm in the moment and we're eating pizza and we're just having fun and caring for myself is really just nourishing this relationships I have with these friends right now, right? So you develop this, this balance, okay? So those are the most important things, the most important things, okay? If you don't do those things, then the way you work out and the diet you go on doesn't matter because you're not going to end up, you're going to be part of that 90 plus percent that end up, you know, going back to where you were before. And by the way, the statistics show that each time you fail majorly in that way, that not only do you gain the weight back, for example, you add weight on top of it. And each successive attempt becomes more and more challenging to the point where people eventually give up. They eventually go, I've tried this for, you know, I've tried this five times. I'm just not going to do it anymore. Okay. So you want to approach this with the mindset of how can I do this in a way to where I'm not going to stop? That's the most important thing. Okay. Once we get that done and we've got that down, and again, I don't want to, you know, breeze over that. That is the most important piece right there. What I'm about to say, people focus on the most, but what I'm about to say is a small piece of this whole thing. Everybody focuses on what I'm about to say right now when they need to focus on what I just talked about. So let's remember that. So what I'm about to say plays a role, but is only this much importance in comparison to the importance of what we just talked about. So don't get caught up in what I'm about to say, and this is what people will sell to you, and this is what you're going to see marketed to you, and there's going to be more emphasis placed upon what I'm about to say than anything else. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's not nearly as important. Okay. However, if you do what I just talked about, then you can go to what's the most effective workout plan and what's the most effective nutrition approach to getting myself to become healthy. So let's talk about the most effective workout plan. Now, I already said that the, the strongest, most important consideration is which workout am I going to stick to? So if your answer is, well, I don't necessarily hate one versus the other more, or I'm somewhat flexible to the way I'm going to work out, then we can look at, okay, if you're somewhat flexible, now let's consider just effectiveness with the workouts. And when you look at effectiveness in terms of time spent versus, you know, or not time spent and the type of results you get with the time you spend doing that form of exercise, strength training is the most effective form of exercise, okay? 
So in other words, if you're only going to exercise once or twice a week, the benefits you'll gain from strength training will supersede the benefits you'll gain from any other form of exercise. But again, I do want to be clear, it's not going to give you any goal results if you don't do it. So consider that, right? But if you're like, look, I'll strength train or I'll do, I'll run or I'll do yoga, you know, like which one's the most effective? Cause I'll, all of them doesn't make a huge difference to me. Strength training is the most effective one. Why? Because the adaptations that strength training induces in the body make getting results easier because the main adaptation from strength training is building strength and building muscle. The side effect of which being a faster metabolism. So because I'm building muscle, I'm actually teaching my body to burn more calories on its own, which is great because if I'm burning more calories all the time, it's going to make being lean a lot easier. I don't need to like keep moving to burn these extra calories. I'm kind of teaching my body to burn these extra calories. So that's number one. Number two, muscle is extremely protective, especially in the context of a sedentary lifestyle, which most people have in modern societies. What do I mean by that? Well, muscle is very insulin sensitive. So it helps with blood sugar, insulin regulation. Muscle is a place that you also store, that you also have stored energy, stored carbohydrates. So it does those things. It also balances out hormones better than other forms of exercise because the muscle building process requires a youthful hormone profile. So when I tell my body to build muscle, and if all the if the environment is appropriate, meaning I'm you know I'm still getting enough sleep and I'm feeding my body appropriately, then what my body will do to build muscle is organize its hormones in the best way to build that muscle. And what that looks like is a youthful hormone profile. So think of you know when you think of a person, the ages that we tend to build muscle the easiest is like you know mid teens to you know maybe early 30s. Okay, you can kind of put that general. In men, that's higher testosterone levels. That's, you know, better androgen receptor density. In women, it's, you know, a better balance of estrogen progesterone. In both men and women, it's more growth hormone production. It's an appropriate cortisol response. So it just, strength training tends to organize your hormones in a youthful way. And that makes, you know, being lean and fit and mobile a lot easier with less time spent in the gym. It just is, right? If I, if I only work out one day a week and I'm comparing different forms of exercise, well, the one that's going to make my hormones more optimal is just going to make it easier for me to do that um, versus one that's not going to necessarily do that, right? So that would be the other you know, side of this. And then lastly, I would say this also I, I think is actually quite important. I, in fact, I should have said this before I talked about the forms of exercise, but it's really important to help yourself become aware of all of the values that exercise and better nutrition provide you. All right, what do I mean by that? Well, most people really only allow themselves to be aware of a few different things when they're exercising and they've changed their diet. Number one is weight loss. Like they're very aware if they lose weight or body fat, okay? Another one might be, you know, if they're stronger in the gym, people tend to notice that as well. But here's what people tend to not pay attention to, which is also quite profound. Better sleep, uh, better libido. My skin health looks better. My hair and nail health look better. Better digestion, more balanced mood, more stable energy, okay? So it's important that you... And I always tell, I used to tell clients to keep track of these things because it helps you become aware because we've hyper-focused on the weight loss that we tend to lose focus of this other stuff. Like I, I, this used to happen to me all the time. I'd get a client, we'd start working out, you know, 30, 60 days in. They're like, you know, I haven't lost that much weight yet on the scale, which is normal, especially in the beginning. And I'll say, okay, how's your sleep been? And then they'll have to think about it. I'll be like, you know what? Now that you mentioned it, man, I'm sleeping way better. I'll say, okay. And I'll mark that down on their chart. And I'll say, well, how about your libido? Any changes in libido? Oh yeah. Like uh, I definitely feel like I have a more youthful libido. I'll be like, all right, that's cool. I'll say, what about your moods? Do you feel like you're in a better mood more often? And they'll think about it and be like, you know what? Now that you say it, yeah. And then all of a sudden they're like, wow, 
this has been an amazing two months, right? Whereas before, they were like, I lost one pound on the scale. I'm failing. This sucks. It's not working, okay? So you want to make yourself aware of all these things because there are changes that are happening that may not be reflected on the scale. And those are positive changes. And when you can identify them, it's going to feel really good to continue. If you don't pay attention to them or ignore them, either because you're purposefully uh, ignoring them or which most likely is you're just not aware because you're not even knowing to pay attention to those things. You know, if you don't notice those things, it's going to make it really hard. You're going to feel like maybe you're kind of wasting your time with your workouts. So it's really important to do those things. And I think if you approach with the things that I just talked about, you're looking at a success rate north of 70%. And I mean forever success. And that's just been my experience. That's huge. That's a big difference. You're looking at it, you know, going from 10% to 70% success rate. Now, I will say this. Expect to hit speed bumps along the way. Expect that there's going to be challenges in this process. It is a journey. I know people have heard this. You know, people say it's, you know, it's a journey. It's a journey. It totally is a journey. And it is a never-ending journey because you are never the same person. You're always changing. Your mind is changing. Your lifestyle is changing. And so as you get older, as life changes, as your job changes and stress levels change and all that stuff, so will the values that your exercise brings to you. So will the values that your diet brings to you. And so will the types of exercise that you do and how hard you do it and how long you work out and how you eat and all those things. So it is a journey because it is a never ending journey. It's not a destination you get to and then you stop. You're like, oh, I'm cool. I'm here. Now I'm done. It doesn't work that way. So I think if people were communicated, if the fitness space communicated fitness and health this way more often, I think people, we would see a much higher success rate. Now, the reason why they don't is because that's hard to monetize. It's easy to monetize a supplement, right? It's easy to monetize a weird diet or here's the secret, you know? It's carbs, it's sugar, it's fat, it's, you know, whatever. So because of the monetization, because it is a market of this space, we get this skewed image of what is important, what is impactful, and what isn't. Like, if you just looked at the market, you would think that supplements really made a tremendous difference. And I'm going to tell you right now, supplements make almost no difference at all when it comes to this entire process. I mean, there are occasions where if you have a nutrient deficiency, then supplements can be a game changer. Like if you're low in, you know, iron or vitamin D or whatever, well, yeah, your body's not, op you know, operating the way it should. But aside from that, supplements are nothing in comparison to all the stuff that I just talked about. Behavior change, man, it's, it's so important. I know I love how you spent most of your time talking about like how to prep yourself to make these behavior changes and how to embrace the journey, how to play the long game, how, how to identify like why you're doing this. And then as a byproduct of that, like you're going to be more willing and and you're going to be able to be better at adhering to whatever exercise program that you choose to do. You're going to be more willing to do that strength training program or go to the gym or walk or whatever path it is that you choose to go down, right? Yeah, let me jump in because consider this, okay? Let's say you're, you're you and you're like, I want to become a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, okay? I think we all know that that's a long journey and there's a long learning process of doing so. We tend to not realize that when it comes to weight loss or improving our appearance, you know, through exercise, nutrition, or improving our health. We don't really consider that, but think of it this way. Think of yourself right now, and then think of yourself, you know, 30 pounds lighter, more fit, stronger, healthier, different mindset, all that stuff, okay? If you look at those two, besides the physical differences, which are profound, the person who is the 30 pound lighter version of you and all that stuff is also different in pretty much every other aspect. That is a different you. So you're going to go from you here to you much different. Yeah, that's not going to happen overnight. That is a process. It is a learning and growth process. And I've said this before many times, fitness, what I love most about fitness is that it is an amazing vehicle for personal growth. It's an amazing vehicle for personal growth, mainly because nobody realizes that it's a vehicle for personal growth. 
Like nobody goes, you know, I'm going to start working out because I want to become a better, you know, different person. I want to do this personal growth journey. Like nobody says that. Everybody's like, I want to look better, right? I want to have better abs, okay? They don't realize that they're embarking on a personal growth journey. Now, why am I saying it's a personal growth journey? Because here's what you end up learning. Well, you learn self-acceptance. That's a big one. That is a huge lesson you learn with fitness if you stick to it long enough. What do I mean by that? Well, at some point, you end up accepting that you end up accepting your body's limitations. You end up accepting the limitations of your lifestyle and what's really important to you. Like you might have said, I want a six pack. And then you eventually be like, you know what? I know what it takes to get a six pack. And uh, I don't want a six pack because I'm not trying to work out six days a week. I like to hang out with my kids. I like my business. I just want to be healthy acceptance, right? Or you might say, I want to look like that, that girl on social media. And then at some point you're like, I'm never going to look like that girl on social media because I'm me acceptance. So I'm just going to continue doing this anyway. You also learn how to fail. What do I mean by that? Well, you're going to suck at any and all exercises that you try the first, you know, 20 times. They're just going to be hard. You're not going to feel right. They're going to be awkward. It's going to be weird. So you got to fail at them. You got to suck at them and you got to keep going back and you got to suck at it and you got to keep going back. What a wonderful learning process that is. In fact, when you do this long enough, you know, like Doug, you've been doing this for a long time. You probably now appreciate and embrace the times you try new exercises that you suck at because now you appreciate the process of getting better at it. Whereas, you know, when you first start working out and you suck at something, you probably beat yourself up. Like, oh, I suck. I can't even do a push up or ah, pull ups. I don't even want to try doing those pull ups. Well, now if I try something and I can't do it, I'm like, cool, this is something that I'm going to practice, you know, and get better doing. You develop a healthy relationship with pain and struggle. This is really big. This is really big. Most of us, because we grow up in this modern society that's cushy, air conditioned, or, you know, heated, 72 degrees all the time, comfortable chairs, you know, working on computers or whatever. We don't have a relationship with pain that is healthy. We have a relationship with pain where it's scary. We don't understand it. We avoid the hell out of it, okay? When you exercise, it hurts. You know, I remember uh, as an early trainer, this, this would happen occasionally. I remember thinking, this is weird. You know, and eventually it made sense to me, but I'd have a client try and exercise for the first time. Like, I, like I remember specifically there was this woman who'd never done strength training before, right? She hired me and... She was in the late 40s. And we were doing a tricep press down for, she'd never done this before for the first time. Very basic exercise for the back of the arms, right? With the triceps. And it, I put, you know, very lightweight because she'd never done it before. And she's, you know, doing her reps, doing her reps. And she suddenly let go of the cable and the weight stack <laughs> slams down. And she goes, oh my God. And I said, what's the matter? Oh my God, I, I, I think I hurt myself. And so I'm like, oh, okay, where's the pain? What happened, right? I'm starting to assess. Well, it turns out her triceps were burning. And she never really felt what that felt like. Freaked her out. She had no idea. And I remember thinking, that's weird. But then it's like, well, yeah, I guess if you've never really done something like that, you don't have a relationship with that kind of pain. To you, it's just pain. Oh my God, this is bad. So when you look at, for example, somebody who's exercised consistently for, let's say, 10 years, and they work out versus somebody who just started working out now, the person who's worked out for 10 years feels as much or more pain during the workout than the beginner. Probably more because they're pushing themselves harder. They have a higher level of conditioning and yet they don't fear it. They don't run away from it. It doesn't make them like avoid the workout. In fact, the experienced person who's worked out for a long time embraces that challenge and that type of pain. They've developed a relationship with pain, right? Now, what's the carryover? Life, life hurts. By the way, as you change your relationship to physical pain, you also get better at dealing with all kinds of stresses and all kinds of pains. In fact, you know, one of the, the number one comments I would get, especially from my female clients, was how much more confident they felt in their everyday life. Part of it was because they were stronger, but the other part of it was they were just more, they were more aware of what their bodies were capable of doing. They had developed a new relationship with pain. Okay. Now, what does that, what does that mean? Well, I mean, there's good pain, there's bad pain. 
And developing a good relationship and understanding the two means you can push yourself appropriately or not. It means you're more effective in life. And by the way, this has carryover to mental pain and stress and that kind of stuff. They'll find that people who exercise just generally handle stressful situations better as well. So, so this, it's this incredibly powerful vehicle for personal growth. And when you view it that way, it it's becomes amazing in the sense that you start to appreciate the journey. You start to appreciate, you know, just the process. And by the way, and this is super important, if you learn to appreciate the process, then you're going to hit the goals. You are going to get the progress. Those just become a, a wonderful side effect, right? If you, if you love the process that you're going through, if you love the process of improving your diet, if you love the process of caring for yourself through exercise, are you going to reap benefits? Are you going to lose body fat? Are you going to get stronger? Are you going to improve your health? Yes, 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 yes. And they're all side effects. They're all wonderful side effects. And it doesn't matter anymore because, you know, if you just focus on, I got to hit this goal and say, so like, okay, I hit this goal. Now what? But if the goal happens as a side effect of this process that you love, you just keep going. And now you've got this lifelong personal growth vehicle that you're, you're sitting in and driving for the rest of your life. And you got to view it this way. I know it sounds kind of philosophical and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, I just want to lose 15 pounds. But I'm telling you right now, you have to view it this way if your goal is to get better health and stay healthier. Now, if your goal is to lose weight and gain it back, well, then, then ignore everything I said and then just do what you've done before. But if you want to like, look, I want to do this and I don't want to gain the weight back and I want to do this for the rest of my life and I want to be able to enjoy this, well, then really focus on the words that I just said. Now, a trainer like myself who's worked with people for so long, I'm going to ask them another question and say, well, which one do you like the most? And that's based off of experience. I know it doesn't matter what form of exercise I recommend to you. The one that you like is the one that you're going to be most consistent at. And that goes for all the advice uh, that we talk about and that we give people is that, you know, is this really going to work? Can I communicate it in a way that it's going to be effective? And does this fit the context of this person's life and their goals? Like, is the advice I'm going to give them really going to work forever? Not just in the short term, because we have a big problem in the, in the fitness space, in the health space in which, you know, we don't have a weight loss problem. People lose weight all the time. The, the problem we have is keeping it off. The problem we have is that that maintenance. And it's not because people lack discipline. It's not because people are lazy, but rather because the way that we've been selling fitness, the way we've been communicating it is just, it's not, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for people. Unless you're a fitness fanatic, in which case you'd probably become, you know, a personal trainer like me. So that's a lot of what I talk about in this book. Uh, to give you another example, the the fitness paradigm that the fitness industry has been promoting for so long is is the wrong paradigm. It's so wrong and it's done so much damage. It's it's it hasn't done anything to solve the problems that the fitness industry actually has the solutions to solve. If you look at the the chronic health issues that we you know can suffer from, you know, obesity and then of course all the diseases and, and chronic illnesses that come from obesity, diabetes. Uh, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, um, you know, bone weakening, so osteoporosis. These are all chronic things that are exploding and that actually threaten to bankrupt our societies. If any industry at all has the answers to solve that, it's the fitness and health industry. The problem is we've been promoting this, this paradigm that's totally false. And the paradigm is this, is in order to lose weight, which would improve your health because obesity is one of the big problems. In order to do that, you just need to burn more calories than you take in, or to put it differently, take in less calories uh, than you burn. Now from that, and that's that's true, there's truth there, right? You have, that has to happen in order for you to, to, to lose body fat. And through that process, you become healthier, there's less inflammation. I mean, in, a, in that type of a uh, scenario, sugar, although still not necessarily good for you, it's much better for you when you have that context. And so that's definitely very true. The problem is we've looked at exercise as this calorie burning part of the formula. So, okay, diet. Okay, we'll talk about that. But exercise, well, exercise burns calories. So let's just pick the form of exercise that burns the most calories. That makes sense. Mm. The problem with that is that it actually doesn't work that way. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why. One, 
is that the body adapts to exercise. In fact, that's one. That's what you really want to focus on. You don't want to focus on what's happening while you work out. You want to focus on how does this workout or how does this exercise teach my body or tell my body to change and adapt? And then what does that mean, right? So we've been looking at it as how many calories does this form of exercise burn? Pick the one that burns the most. And so for a long time now, for decades now, when talking about obesity or studying obesity or studying exercise as a way to solve some of our problems, we've always picked the calorie burning forms of exercise, which typically are cardiovascular forms of exercise. Now, cardiovascular exercise does burn a lot of calories um, during the time that you're performing it, but the adaptations that it triggers actually create a situation in which it makes fat loss harder later, uh, longer down the road. Hmm. And um, it's hard to maintain. It's very hard to maintain. It's a very manual way of, of getting what you want. Not to mention people don't want to exercise every single day. I mean, here's the truth. After having trained, you know, hundreds or thousands of people by proxy, pe the average person we can expect realistically, and this is the truth, about two days, maybe three days a week of exercise. If we're talking long term, you know, if we're talking like my aunt or my mom or my uncle, not like me or you or... You're looking at about two or three days a week is about as far as we're going to get. It's just not, we're not going to get people working out five, six, seven days a week. It's not going to happen. So what can we do two or three days a week to really impact us in the most effective way possible? Well, cardiovascular exercise is a terrible approach with that. Yes, it burns calories, but it doesn't burn as much as you think. You know, an hour of hard cardio might burn 500 calories. Well, you do that twice a week. That's a thousand calories over a, a whole week. Not much. Not to mention, I mean, you know, obviously it's easy to eat a thousand calories. I mean, mm -hmm. I could eat that in five minutes. Not to mention the adaptations that cardiovascular exercise uh, causes in the body actually teach my body to burn less calories. It's teaching my body to become efficient with calorie burn because cardiovascular activity doesn't require much strength. So we don't need much strength to do this. Uh, we're burning a lot of calories while we're doing it. Let's reduce muscle because that actually makes us more efficient and effective at doing this activity, mm. which, which is why when you look at uh, like long distance runners, they have very little muscle on their bodies. Their bodies essentially have turned into these very efficient calorie machines, which in the context of modern life, you don't want that. Now, if, if we were a thousand years ago and food was very scarce, like I want my body to burn very little calories, but I want my body to burn a lot of calories because I mean, food is everywhere, right? So understanding that, like what form of exercise teaches my body to burn more calories? What form of exercise directly through the adaptation process? Because the adaptation process continues with exercise. Through the adaptation process, what form of exercise directly combats all those, all these, these modern health issues that we're all going to be running into? And when you look at it that way, there's one form of exercise that stands head and shoulders above the rest, and that's resistance training. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, resistance training is uh, superior for those things. Uh, number one, it tells your body you need to be strong. You need to have muscle. Muscle is very metabolically active. It burns more calories. So now that rather than me exercising all the time to burn more calories, I could just sit here and burn more calories. I can essentially have a faster metabolism. It also, and this is uh, this is something that you're um, very knowledgeable about. Muscle is one of the best ways to improve insulin sensitivity. It's one of the best ways. In fact, studies show that having more muscle, regardless of overall body mass, so you could be obese, building muscle improves insulin sensitivity. Strength training or resistance training is the only form of exercise to date that has been shown to potentially stop the progression of dementia and Alzheimer's, probably through that process of increasing insulin sensitivity and getting your body to utilize glucose or glycogen much more effectively because muscle does store some glycogen. It does utilize some of that glucose. So again, another big problem solved or potentially solved with a, a resistance training. The best part is that it doesn't need to be done all the time. In mm. fact, you know, I, I know there's people who lift weights five days a week and train quite a bit. It takes a long time to even get your body to that point. Yeah. Two days a week of, of traditional resistance training for the average person is plenty to give the kind of results and, and benefits that we're talking about. It also, there is no such thing as like permanent 
fitness results from exercise. It just doesn't work that way, right? You have to, whatever you do to get in shape, you have to do to stay in shape. However, again, we're looking at like regular life, right? We can expect that the average person is going to miss workouts, miss a couple weeks because of vacation. Maybe they get sick. Maybe they lose kind of their momentum and they stop working out for a month. Okay. What form of exercise protects you the longest uh, in terms of a period of time that you're not engaging in it? Again, that's resistance training. Have you heard of the term muscle memory? Yeah, of course. Okay. So this is a very real thing. Thank God for muscle memory. (laughs) That's right. If you've ever had a, a cast... Uh, on your arm or your leg and you take that cast off, you know how small the muscle is and then how fast it builds. Like to give you uh, another example, if it took me 10 years to build 10 pounds of lean body mass and then I lost it in a couple months because I was sick or whatever, I could gain that 10 pounds back within a a couple months. So it might have taken me a year to gain it the first time. I'll gain it back if I lose it afterwards very, very quickly. And there's a whole there's a, a whole complicated explanation as to why it has to do with satellite cells that really don't go away. And but muscle memories are a very real thing. So when you do resistance training and you stop working out, first off, the muscle gains go away much slower than the maybe the stamina gains you may get from cardiovascular activity. So it doesn't it doesn't go away quite as quickly. But if it does, it comes back very fast. So mm. there was a study that was done recently where they took two groups of men. One group exercised every single week consistently. The other group exercised three weeks on, one week off. Okay, so every every three weeks, they would take an entire week off and they were measuring their performance and their muscle. And as you would predict, every time they take a week off, they would dip a little bit in performance and maybe a little bit in muscle, right? But at the end of this period of this whole study, you know what they found? What? Equal muscle and strength gains. So even though they took a week off every three weeks, at the end of the this st- sixteen week study, they had built just as much strength and muscle as the other group. So it just it, it just goes to show you the resilience that resistance training really provides your body. And I can't think of a better time to utilize that, which is right now. So we always have to consider the context of things. You know, anytime a client would try to hire me and ask me questions, I would always have to understand your goals and how many days a week you can realistically work out all the time and what are we working with and what do you like? And context is very, very important. And when we understand the context of what's going on right now, it's it's resistance training. Other stuff I cover in the book really is is the, the stigma and the stereotype that is damaged um, a lot of people's health because they don't even think to go do resistance training or strength training. You like, know? What are some of the misconceptions that you would say in, you know, uh, in, s- define that stigma. Like, what, what, what is that about? Yeah. So, um, you know, resistance training is make me big and bulky. Uh, mm. This is really, especially for women. Oh, if I if I do resistance training, I get big and bulky. Okay, so that's that's false. Um, it's actually quite hard to build muscle. Also, muscles very dense. So, if you're watching this right now, and you know, if I had, if I could magically snap my fingers and make you lose five pounds of fat but gain five pounds of muscle, so your weight is the same on the scale you'd actually be much smaller. You'd have a smaller waist, you'd have smaller legs, you'd be much tighter and more compact. So muscle is very, very dense. doesn't take up much uh, space. Um, That's number one. And it gives you shape. This is what resistance training does. In fact, uh, years ago when I managed uh, a big box gym, I used to have this trainer that worked for me and she was 5'1". She loved to lift weights, very fit, very sculpted, very toned. She didn't look crazy or anything like that. And she weighed about 140 pounds and I would call her into my office. Anytime I was talking to a a potential member, it was a woman who would always, you know, they would always express like, I don't want to do weights because I don't want to get big. I call this trainer in. So I do like the, on the intercom, you know, attention, (laughs) you know, staff, you know, so-and-so please come to Sal's office. She would walk in and then I'd say, uh, can you guess, and I'll give you 10 pounds, guess how much she weighs. And they would all say, oh, I don't know, 105, 110 then we'd say, we'd get her on the scale and they'd see she was 140 pounds. It would blow their minds wow. because muscle, you don't look huge with a little bit of muscle on your body. You look tight and sculpted. So that's one of the big ones. But I, think, we, I still think women don't want to see a, uh, just, they don't want to see a higher number on the scale. We got to get rid of the scales. Yeah. It's such a, um, uh, I, I, I get how it's a metric, but by itself, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, for example, I could cut my leg off and I lost weight. Uh, not the kind of weight that I'd want to lose, right? Body composition is what matters. 
So we have BMI, for example, which BMI is correlated to, you know, all these health issues. But if we compared that to body fat percentage, we'd see a far more accurate uh, measure, far more accurate. Really, it's about body composition. I mean, I'm my body weight places me at a higher BMI, but my body fat percentage is is quite low. So that's what, really what we want to what we want to look at. Um, so there's that. And we could talk about the roots of that uh, a little bit later, why that became the way it is. Then you have like the oh, resistance training uh, is going to make me stiff. It's going to it's going to take away from my flexibility. This is also not true. Hmm. Proper full range of motion resistance training is the best form of exercise, best form of exercise for improving functional flexibility. So what's functional flexibility? So flexibility on its own is just range of motion. So how far can I stretch my arm back? Okay. Functional flexibility is do I own that range of motion? Do I have strength in that range of motion? So to give you another example, a baby has tremendous flexibility. So like my five month old, I mean, I could take his foot and put it by his head and put him in the splits. No problem. Does that mean that he's stable? Does that mean his joints are safe? Well, no. If I, if I bend his leg over and put a little load on him, he'd probably dislocate one of his joints and injure himself. So uh, functional flexibility is what you want. You want to have the kind of mobility to where I can twist, reach, grab, squat, but I can do so with my own body weight or even with load if my kid jumps on me or if I go to grab something. Resistance training provides us because when you're training in full ranges of motion, you're doing so with resistance. And of course, you have to do it appropriately. So you want to train within a range of motion that you own, but you can continue to challenge that range of motion and get better and better. And what you do is you start to own it. So now we have studies that actually show that for that kind of flexibility, for mobility and for stability, resistance training is at least as good, but better, usually better than the the typical stretching forms of exercise that we would attribute to good flexibility like yoga for yeah. example. So it's phenomenal uh, for that. Um, here's another one. For heart health, uh, you should do cardiovascular activity, <laughs> not resistance training. Okay, this is actually false. We now have studies that show that for heart health, uh, resistance training is actually superior. Cardiovascular activity is good too. And by the way, I want to I want to let everybody know that all forms of exercise, so long as they're done appropriately, have value. So I'm not saying don't do other forms of exercise. They all have value. All I'm saying is if you had to pick one or you're like the average person, um, then resistance training is the one that you should make the cornerstone of your routine. It's just going to give you the most bang for your buck. But again, the study showed that when it came to heart health, resistance training was superior. And again, it probably had to do with the fact that your insulin sensitivity is much better, reduces inflammation, and your body is slowly turning into kind of this fat burning machine. Um, in fact, if you look at the, as a trainer or anybody, anybody that's works in, if you're watching this and you've worked in gyms before, you know what I'm talking about. People who make cardiovascular activity, running, cycling, whatever, the cornerstone of the routine when they, when they're looking for weight loss, typically what they'll notice is they'll get this initial fast weight loss, then this hard plateau, Mm. right? So, uh, you know, oh, I lost 10 pounds and then nothing. Now my metabolism has adapted. Things right. have slowed down. Um, in order to lose any more body fat now or weight, I should say, I have to do more or cut my calories even more. And by the way, studies confirm this. The weight that you do lose with that form of exercise is usually half muscle, half body fat. So uh, you're actually not getting leaner. You're just getting smaller. Yikes. So uh, in, in other words, if you're if you lose 10 pounds and half is muscle, half is fat, your body fat percentage has actually stayed the same. I've actually seen people lose weight and their body fat percentage go up. Wow. Because they lost more muscle than body fat. Remember, it's, it's a percentage of your body weight. That's what's important, right? So, you know, I may be lean at 210 pounds, but if you took my body fat and put it on a five foot person, it'd probably be a lot more because they have so much less body mass. So they're actually exercising their way to being skinny fat. Absolutely. That's insane. hundred percent. So, so they'll, they'll, they'll notice this quick drop and then this hard plateau. Now with resistance training, you notice a slower weight loss, but then it starts to snowball as the metabolism kicks in, as things start to work, you get the snowball effect. And then you get to this point where you're doing it consistently for four five, six months. And you're like, this is weird. I'm eating more than I did before. And I'm just getting leaner. And those are the kind of comments that I would get from clients that come to me and be like, this is Sal, I'm eating more food. 
I'm getting leaner. I'm only working with you two days a week or three days a week. Like, this is really strange. You're like, what's going on here? I'm like, well, your metabolism is really, you know, kicking into gear. So, uh, so back to the heart health, it does a tremendous job for heart health. We talked about the brain. You want to talk about brain health? Again, now we have studies that show that it's so far, again, there's only form of exercise that actually has halted um, what the, the, the things that happen that turn into Alzheimer's or dementia, resistance training. And they think it has to do with the insulin sensitivity and the, the way the body utilizes, you know, gly, uh, glucose. I, I know that uh, some researchers refer to Alzheimer's and dementia as type 3 diabetes. Yeah, it's shocking. Uh, yeah, because of that, right? Um, so there you go. So, and, and there's so many more. I mean, bone health, this is very obvious. Uh, if you're building muscle, you're building bone. There's no form of exercise that'll stop or reverse osteopenia um, like resistance training. There's just nothing, nothing like it. Um, brain health from a different, here's from a different standpoint, proprioceptive ability. Hmm. That's the, that's knowing where my body is in space, right? Most forms of exercise are very repetitive. So if I run, it's the same motion. If I walk, it's the same motion. If I cycle, if I resistance training is just, there's an almost infinite number of movements and exercises and ways to position my body. It's not one of those types of workouts that I could just not think about while I'm doing. You're focused, you're there, you're present, you're placing your feet down, you're moving in a particular way with intention and control. And so it really does develop those parts of the brain that have to do with body awareness and balance you know, better than other forms of exercise. And, you know, part of the challenge has been that the studies on exercise that we've done, you know, now for the last four or five decades, the vast majority of them, if it had to do with health, it was done with cardiovascular exercise usually. Right. It was almost never done with resistance training. Why is that? Pro partially because resistance training really was relegated to weightlifting mm. and athletic performance. So if they did a study on athletic performance or strength, then you would sometimes see resistance training. But but if it had to do with health, like, oh, how does exercise improve blood pressure or blood lipid levels? Or how does exercise help with cognition? They almost never picked resistance training. So these other forms of exercise got all this amazing publicity through these studies. Resistance training had no studies. I also think like from a basic science standpoint, it's a lot easier to get an animal to do cardiovascular or, That's you know, a, quote unquote aerobic exercise uh, than it is to get an animal to, to lift weights. That's, that's a not, not a bad point. I didn't even think of that. Absolutely. Now though, we are seeing a lot of studies on resistance training and it's starting to really open up. Um, for example, there, if you, a simple strength test is one of the best single metrics that can predict all cause mortality. Yeah. Even like grip strength, That's which it. is sort of a, like a surrogate proxy marker for full body vigor. Yeah. I don't know how, I don't know how tightly that's correlated, but you know, if you're, if you have a weak grip, that's probably a pretty good sign that you're, a, that you're frail. That's what the studies show. So like, you know, if you want to predict all cause mortality, it's obviously best to have multiple yeah. tests and parameters, but, Data if points, yeah. but if you just had one, Believe it or not, strength, testing someone's strength is actually one of the most accurate predictors. And they, they do it either through grip or a simple, can you get up off the floor without having to grab onto something test? Wow. That's it. And they can actually predict all-cause mortality relatively accurately with that versus even testing your blood lipids or your, or your blood pressure. So it's, it's pretty incredible. And if you look at what's happened to us with our modern lives, we're so sedentary yeah, we're so busy, right? So it's not like we're not doing anything. We got things are so scheduled all the time. And I got to take the kids here and I got a job and then I'm going to do this. And then, so we're very sedentary, uh, but we're also very busy and we're just weak. We're very weak. We don't have much strength. We don't have much muscle and muscle is in, is such an incredible protect. It's, it's like a, it's like a suit of armor that hmm. protects you against chronic disease against, uh, you know, uh, degeneration of the brain or the joints. And we have none of it. And then what, what do we do? We tell people here, you want to exercise, go do this form of exercise that is going to make you not build any muscle or maybe even lose a little bit of muscle. So it's no, it's no wonder people work out and they're like, this isn't working for me. Why, why am I not getting good results? I lost some weight for the first month and now I'm where I'm at and I'm not eating very much and it's just not working for me. Um, here's another good point. Hormones. So, uh, 
re- recently we're starting to really, uh, you're starting to see this now in mainstream. We're talking about the kind of the testosterone uh, epidemic that we're seeing in men. So testosterone levels are just, they've been declining for, for decades now. So mm. I believe the last statistic I saw showed that a 20, like a 26 year old male, I think it's 26 year old male today on average has the testosterone levels of a 60 year old male in the, in the eighties, just wow. to give you an example of, of what's happening. No form of exercise reliably raises testosterone like resistance training. Mm. In fact, resistance training not only raises low testosterone, but it raises high testosterone. So no matter where your testosterone levels are, you're going to get higher levels typically if you train uh, with resistance uh, properly. It also increases androgen receptor density. Wow. So androgen receptors are the receptors that testosterone will attach to. In fact, they did a study where they were trying to see if how strongly correlated testosterone levels were to strength and muscle gains. So they took men and they had them work out and they tested their testosterone. And they found that natural, so long as it was within a healthy parameter, a healthy range, that the testosterone levels actually didn't make a big difference. It was the androgen receptor density that made the big difference. So Mm. the men with the higher density of androgen receptors just built more muscle and had faster results than the people with the, you know, with with fewer androgen receptor uh, density or with less, I should say. Resistance training increases uh, androgen receptor density uh, quite reliably. In women... It's it balances out estrogen and progesterone mm. uh, again quite reliably, and it's probably because resistance training of all forms of exercise it's a pro tissue form of exercise. Other forms of exercise not so much. In fact, other forms of exercise, directly speaking, are probably more of a anti tissue. Uh, forms of exercise. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by pro-tissue and anti-tissue? So again, if we look at exercise as a stimulus, mm-hmm. how is this stimulus? Because remember, when you're when you're doing any form of exercise and it's challenging, it's a stress on the body. And that that makes your body want to adapt in order to avoid future stress from the same type of insult, right? So if I'm running and I'm, my lungs are burning, it's really challenging. My body's like, this is a stress. Let's improve our stamina so that uh, next time, this is no longer a stress. And then, of course, what do you do? You run longer or run harder and kind of continue that process. Same thing with resistance training or any other uh, form of exercise. So when you exercise with resistance, the stress on the body says, we need more strength. The direct result of that is building muscle. So it's mm. pro-tissue, mm. right? Other forms of exercise, uh, like running, for example, as I'm running, burning lots of calories, also telling my body, we need to become more efficient with calories. So it's reducing tissue. It's wow. taking away. And now think about the hormones that are associated with building muscle and then the hormones that are associated with taking it away, right? So you have like cortisol and stress hormones versus like testosterone or a balance of, or and growth hormone or a balance of estrogen and progesterone. So like when I would get clients that were women who had hormone issues um, and I would always work with a functional medicine practitioner uh, resistance training was just, it was just superior. I'd have them come in and oftentimes these women were not getting enough sleep or lots of stress, maybe under eating fats. That was quite common. So we'd kind of fix some of that stuff. And then I would train them and the routine would be this very traditional straight set, you know, compound lift type resistance training uh, routine. So they come see me and we would, I would, you know, get them to get good at squats and deadlifts and presses and rows. And they'd work with me, you know, a couple days a week and we would rest, you know, two minutes in between sets because the goal again is to send the right signal, not necessarily burn a ton of calories during the workout. And you would, they would get tremendous results. And I would compare that to women who would work with a functional medicine practitioner and then go do like hit classes or Zumba or spin classes. And at some point the, their functional medicine doctors would say, stop, that is not helping. It's actually making this much more challenging. Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's really bad. It's it's terrible that, again, because here's my goal with the book, right? And, and, and the way I communicate this in the book is very much, it's very easy to understand. And my goal with it is to get to the point where, you know, the average person is, I don't know, they go to the doctor and the doctor 
looks at their cholesterol or whatever and says, you know, you should probably exercise. And then they think to themselves, I think I'll go lift some weights. Yeah. That's the goal. As opposed to I'll start, you know, I'll take up jogging. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so that's really the, the, the focus of it. Um, and I talk a little bit about the history of resistance training. We get into some nutrition stuff as well. Um, again, as a trainer, when it comes to nutrition, I focus more on encouraging the behaviors that lead to, uh, you know, better eating versus the the mechanisms of nutrition. Like, so you're not just all about calorie deficits. No, <laughs> I mean, it's, this is the, and again, this is the problem. You know, when you have the, the, the scientists and researchers who are trying to communicate how to solve this problem, they don't know how to communicate it. All they can tell you are the, are the mechanisms. And we've been told burn more calories, eat less calories forever. Yeah. It's totally failing. Well, it's just not a weight loss strategy. It's not irrelevant, but it's not a it doesn't give people the, the tools to know how to proceed. I was, you know, we were talking earlier before we started rolling to me, it's the same as telling somebody who's telling a person with obesity that a calorie deficit is the way to a healthier weight is the same thing to me, identical to telling somebody who's stuck in poverty that the way to get out of poverty is with a money surplus. <laughs> yeah. It's like, thanks, Sherlock. Yeah, yeah. All right. I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible, but not if you guess along the way. So we're going to talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right? Of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher. Body